did dinosaurs live? Where do they fit in the Bible? And how did they go extinct? If you have questions about dinosaurs, join us March 14th through 18th at the ICR Discovery Center for Dinosaur Week. Learn about these remarkable reptiles and the fascinating fossils they left behind from ICR's experts and special guest David Mickelson of Everything Fossil. Experience interactive, hands-on fossil preparation and casting workshops. Unearth dinosaur bones at our fossil dig tables, enjoy our fossil petting zoo, and marvel at our full-size dinosaur fossil exhibit. Visit icr.org slash events to plan your visit.
When did dinosaurs live? Where do they fit in the Bible? And how did they go extinct? If you have questions about dinosaurs, join us March 14th through 18th at the ICR Discovery Center for Dinosaur Week. Learn about these remarkable reptiles and the fascinating fossils they left behind from ICR's experts and special guest David Mickelson of Everything Fossil. Experience interactive, hands-on fossil preparation and casting workshops. Unearth dinosaur bones at our fossil dig tables, enjoy our fossil petting zoo, and marvel at our full-size dinosaur fossil exhibit. Visit icr.org slash events to plan your visit.
In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. If Genesis got it wrong, how can we trust the rest of the Bible? At the Institute for Creation Research, we've spent almost 50 years researching the science when did behind dinosaurs Genesis. Live? Where Our they investigations fit in the Bible? range from geological formations of the earth if you to have human questions about dinosaurs, join us from March 14th tissues and dinosaur fossils fossils at the ICR to the Discovery Center of galaxies, for dinosaurs, quantum mechanics, and dark Learn about these remarkable With reptiles and the fascinating the fossils they left behind from ICR's stronger. experts and special guests ICR David Mitchelson of Everything Fossil. To showcase our scientists' research, interactive, the ICR Discovery Center for Science and Earth History is inspiring the next generation with the wonders of our creators and teaching them how to use Marvel at our full-size dinosaur fossil exhibit. Visit icr.org slash events all to plan your visit. support our scientific research and educational programs. Together, let's help students, ministry leaders, and families hold fast to the truth of God's Word, from the first page to the last. Good morning. Now I know the coffee's still kicking in, but I still think we can do better than that. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to the Darwin Dethroned Seminar at the ICR Discovery Center. It is so good to have you all with us today, and welcome also to those who are live streaming with us on YouTube. It's good to have you all join us today as well. And for those on YouTube and for those here, don't forget that anytime ICR releases new content or has events like these that are recorded, it's also available on YouTube. So be sure to subscribe so that you always are the first to know when new content is released. So just as some important background for today, most of you probably already know this, but a man named Charles Darwin was born on February 12th, 1809. And just in the recent years, there was a holiday dedicated to him called Darwin Day, February 12th. That day is meant to celebrate the contributions that Darwin gave to Darwinian evolutionary theory. Now, is that worth celebrating? That's the question we're asking and answering today. And spoiler alert, no. Darwinian evolution goes directly against what God has revealed in his word regarding what happened at the beginning of all time. And we can trust that. We don't need to prove the Bible. It can stand on its own two feet. But at the same time, it stands up to scrutiny. And that's what we want to explore today. So hopefully your faith is strengthened. And this event is not just about dethroning Darwin. ICR is not just about dethroning Darwin. It's about reminding ourselves and others who really sits on the throne, our Lord Jesus Christ, and giving him the glory and honor that he deserves as the designer, creator, and sustainer of all things. So hopefully we can really establish our hearts on that today. Just a couple practical notes, just as a reminder, 
if you're here, you are registered for the Darwin Dethroned event and seminar. Your registration does not include tickets to the ICR Discovery Center Exhibit Hall and Planetarium. So just keep in mind, this event will go until about 2.30. But after that, we encourage you to go explore our Exhibit Hall and Planetarium. You will need additional tickets for that. And those are available at the front desk right over there. Also, at the end of today, we do have a Q&A session with our scientists. We want to know about y'all's questions. We might not be able to get to all of them, but there is a very practical way that you can let us know your questions, and you can do that at any point from now until the Q&A session itself. And that is by texting your question to, get out your phone if you'd like, or a notepad, I'll give you a couple seconds. You can text your question to 833-626- 2572. Again, one more time, that's 833-626-2572. And I'll give that number to you again throughout the morning. You can text your questions to that number anytime throughout the day, and we will try to get to as many of them as possible. Now, for our first speaker of today, I would like to introduce Dr. Brian Thomas. Dr. Thomas has his Master of Science in Biotechnology from Stephen F. Austin State University, and he also has his PhD in Paleobiochemistry from the University of Liverpool. He has taught junior high and high school at Christian schools in Texas, as well as biology, chemistry, and anatomy as an adjunct and assistant professor at Dallas area universities. In 2008, Dr. Thomas joined the Institute for Creation Research as a science writer and editor contributing news and magazine articles, speaking on creation issues, and researching original tissue fossils. He currently serves at ICR as a research scientist. He is the author of many books, including Dinosaurs and the Bible, and he's also a contributor to Guide to Creation Basics, Creation Basics and Beyond, Guide to Dinosaurs, Guide to the Human Body, Guide to the Universe, and Dinosaurs, God's Mysterious Creatures. His dissertation, Ancient and Fossil Bone Collagen Remnants, is also available in book form. Please welcome with me ICR research scientist, Dr. Brian Thomas. Thank you. Thanks for coming today. Are you ready for some science? Yeah. A little bit? Well, I got that cute little PhD from the University of Liverpool. You heard that, right? That degree required me to go to the UK. It was a, you know, a burden. So when I'm there, I had to get cash to buy stuff. And so I have a 10 pound note with the late queen on it. And there's no one in the front row, so I have to ask the second row, whose likeness is on the back of this 10 pound note? Anyone recognize it? See, see Charles Darwin? Venerated in the UK. Darwin was from the UK. And that's the whole purpose of this conference is to ask ourselves, does Darwin deserve the credit for doing such great stuff? And um, the Darwinian view uh, is, so Darwin is celebrated over there and here, uh, but why is it so celebrated? And should we celebrate him and what he did? Is it worth celebrating is kind of the question we're, we're asking ourselves. And um, I have the easiest part of all, the easiest role in this whole um, question because the, um, the biochemistry behind living things, the biochemistry that runs each one of our cells right now, um, just um, flies in the face of the concept of, of uh, the concepts that Darwin proposed, okay? So Darwin said, um, you don't need a designer to explain all this apparent design. All you need is natural processes, natural selection is all you need. And that's what he said, and that was his great contribution. The problem being, um, there's, there's no natural process that does the kinds of things that, um, that builds the kinds of uh, well-crafted nanotechnology that, that makes up our cells. Okay, so, um, and yet, when we did a poll, 715 people, scientists have mixed chemicals believed to exist before the first life forms, 
to successfully create simple life forms. Scientists can make life. They've already done it in the lab, right? How many? Give me a percent. How many think true or was the majority true or false? The majority of respondents, would you say people believe this in our culture or, or people, people understand the biochemistry and they're like, no, scientists haven't done that. So raise your hand if you think it's majority true, majority true. Raise your hand if you think it's majority would say no. Okay. R raise, your, raise your hand if you didn't vote at all. <laughs> yeah. Wimps. So if you raised your hand on the true, you'd be correct. So 72%, a big majority. And so our culture is somehow convinced and persuaded that chemicals turn into life. And scientists have shown it in the lab. Not so. Not at all. Not at all. So I'll show you some of that today and why that is. Um, <clears throat> the origin of life requires some raw material that could allow spark of life to emerge. The, this is, these are the sentiments. These are the kinds of things we learn in our textbooks and popular culture. Life began, says a, a um, biology textbook, high school. Life began when organic molecules assembled. <laughs> Voila. <laughs> uh, in a coordinated manner. Because that always happens, right? Uh, within a cell membrane. Where did that come from? And it began reproducing. What a faith statement. Um, just blind faith against all odds. Um, similarly, we get this kind of sentiment, life arose from non-life via chemical evolution. Uh, now, so we're going to debunk chemical evolution and in the next uh, half hour or so. Um, and what we'll see is that logic and science uh, do the work for us so that in the end we land on this, um, we're gonna land on this with more confidence than ever, more confidence than before you walked in these doors. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea, and all that is in them, including bacteria, including cells, because that's, you know, all that is in them includes that, right? Not natural processes. The Lord gets the credit, and shame on us for giving natural processes the credit that the Lord Jesus is gonna deserve here. Well, to answer our big question, um, can natural processes make the first life out of, of just raw chemicals? To answer that, we have to just look at uh, what does it take? What does it take to start life from chemicals? Um, it, do it takes more than just a faith statement. Um, and we have here, this is, um, see the scribble? This is how Charles Darwin hand wrote letters. Uh, he wrote just thousands of letters. Um, and we can learn more about sort of his motivations and, and his personality from what he wrote in those letters than we, than we learned from what he wrote officially in his books. But here's what he said, but if, and oh, what a big if. We could conceive in, in some uh, uh, warm little pond with all sorts of ammonia and phosphoric salts, light, heat, electricity, etc. present, that a protein was formed. Voila! ready to undergo still more complex changes. And that's the concept that we have embed, embedded in apparently 72% of Americans' minds, at least based on that one survey, um, which probably represents at least a majority. But the reality is um, that that is, he could, oh, if we could conceive, turns out it was a raw conception that flies in the face of these 12 impossible steps. But we don't have time to go through all 12 impossible steps, so we're just going to look at seven of them. So, are you ready for seven steps? Yay! So, uh, so if you're taking notes, you're going to look at seven, seven impossible steps. And I think that at the end of these seven steps, you're, you'll, you'll be able to think, ah, I have now more confidence than ever that the Lord Jesus deserves the credit for building life and and, um, and, and then you can take whatever application comes from there. So the first step we're going to look at has to do with the formation and concentration of building blocks. So building blocks, what do I mean by that? Well, just like a building is built with bricks, girders, nails, whatever, you have to start with the, your building block, your, your raw building materials. Chemically speaking, we have tiny chemicals that are built together to make larger chemicals, and those are added together in the right 
places and proportions to make a cell. So that's what we're talking about with building blocks. Well, um, you have to form these building blocks and then um, you, have to, you have to concentrate them. Because in a cell, you have, you have the right kinds of chemicals all in one place. But the natural tendency is for those building blocks to disperse themselves and to spread out. Just like you have um, a bottle of perfume. And if you leave that lid open, what's going to happen to your perfume in about a week? Well, the, the room is going to smell really lovely, unless you don't like the perfume. Uh, but, and it'll be gone. Because the molecules that make up that perfume, they, they occupy whatever volume is going to contain them. So they're going to, sp they're going to spread out evenly into the space of that room. Um, and, and so that means that it'll, that's why you keep the lid on your, on your perfume. Same with these molecules. You have to concentrate them. And there's no natural process that concentrates these. And there's no natural process that builds even the... We can't even get off the ground, is, is what I'm getting at. Now, I'm going to show you a little cartoon, uh, diag a cartoon that illustrates the pr some of the problems that, um, that workers in this field, um, there's, it's, it's, it's a tiny little field, it's more like a niche uh, field, uh, but they're trying, to, they're trying to create the building blocks of life in, uh, in laboratory settings. And they trumpet their results with big fanfare, but... Um, but in reality, it's more, it's more like something like this. One dirty little secret of these origin of life experiments is that they don't actually start with plausible natural conditions. These experimenters, I don't want to say cheated, let's say they, um, they cheated, they sort of just cheated. These scientists begin with pure industrial strength ingredients. These are never found in nature like that in such extreme concentrations and purity. Certainly not all in the same location. Billions of dollars worth of precise machinery created and operated by thousands of very intelligent people in labs all around the world over the course of many decades is what gets us to the point where these experiments can even begin. Another dirty little secret of these origin of life experiments lies in the presentation of their results. Even cheating like they did, what exactly do they end up with? The vast majority of what they make is actually toxic garbage. For example, in this paper, over 99% of what they make is not only unwanted, but effectively destroys the building block's ability to form more complex molecules. The very process that makes these building blocks also, critically, stops them dead in their tracks. A little detail your biology textbook may have left out. The third cheat is something called relay synthesis. They buy industrial strength ingredients to start with, make mostly garbage out of them, but may produce trace amounts of something they wanted. Like in this experiment, they yielded 0.011% of the nucleobase adenine. Then they declare success. These chemicals can technically be turned into adenine, even though it is unavailable to actually do anything because it's surrounded by garbage or consumed by side reactions and would quickly degrade, but whatever, details, details. For the next experiment, rather than starting with what the previous experiment actually produced, this mixture of garbage, instead they now feel justified in purchasing pure adenine from a laboratory supply shop to further cheat at the next step toward life. And this sort of thing happens over and over again, completely detached from reality. So the, any kind of statement like uh, scientists have made life in a test tube is detached from reality. Here's the reality. Uh, we, we go from, uh, uh, from organization to disorganization. Decay and disorder is the rule, and that's what, that's what we see in, um, in natural processes. But yet, um, we've we got to get from, from soup to, uh, to the first sick cell. <laughs> um, and that's called abiogenesis. A, um, uh, well, biogenesis <clears throat> is it's talking about the formation of the first life, the first cell from... Um, chemical soup. So uh, we, go, we go from small molecules that, that in our imagination that, that join themselves together in our imagination to make bigger molecules and then those concentrate themselves and they just it's sort of this self um, accreting um, <clears throat> process. Well we can't even get off the ground because step one is to form, to form these building blocks and you saw in the video that most of what those experiments produce, go back here, 
is um, uh, toxic garbage that is useless to uh, life as we know it. And then if there's one little um, a chemical that, um, that, that is useful to life that appears within that giant mixture, then they, <coughs> um, th they declare success. Um, um, but that's just one, and you have to have, you have to have um, a whole suite. And uh, so it, and it turns out that the, that the ones that form spontaneously, even though they're covered, covered up by garbage, they're the simplest ones. These are the, some of the more complicated building blocks, uh, guanine, tyrosine, and proline. These are used in uh, DNAs and uh, proteins. And every one of these requires an enzyme to build it. And an enzyme is like a molecular um, robot, uh, like a tiny little robot. And so you can't even get a guanine, but you need a guanine and you need tyrosine and you need proline to make your DNAs and your, um, and your proteins. So really the whole, the whole question is, is answered. We can't get from chemicals to life naturally. And, um, it, but let's pretend that we can. It turns out that we have another impossible step, and that is called uh, the chirality issue. So um, we've got this, say chirality for me. Chirality. So it just means handedness, handedness. So, so I have four fingers and one thumb on both hands, but they're oriented a little bit differently so that they're non-superimposable, okay? Uh, and so that since the molecules are oriented the same way. And it turns out that in uh, proteins, uh, every amino acid, which is the building block of protein, they're, um, they're uh, left-handed. Every one of them is left-handed. And if you insert a right-handed, it breaks the protein down. Don't take my word for it. Here's a quote. If only one amino acid is replaced by its optical or chiral counterpart, in other words, if you stick a, a right-handed amino acid into this protein, the forward protein will not fulfill its tasks properly. In other words, it breaks it, you'll break it. So we have, so the question is, how do you get um, out of your mixture of 50-50 right-handed, left-handed, which is what all the experiments produce, the, uh, trying to use natural processes to make these building blocks, how do you pull out just the left-handed ones to make your proteins? And there's no natural process that does this. And DNA is the same, um, but each nucleotide, that's the, the name of the building block that makes up um, uh, uh, DNA, they're called nucleotides, they're in the center. They make sort of the rungs of the DNA ladder, nucleotides, and each one of those doesn't have just one um, handedness, it's got three chiral locations, and kind of like this. So here's a nucleotide, and you can have, you can have it left-handed at position one, or right-handed, left-handed, right-handed at position two on that uh, ribose sugar, and or left-handed or right-handed at position three. So that's two times two times two, or eight different chiral possibilities for each of these. All right, so that's, it's kind of like, it's kind of like, it, it's so you need three billion DNA bases to make up a human genome. And it would be like, um, here's my, my cute little shaker we got at the uh, music store. And let's say I shake, 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 and I can, I'm gonna shake this for one million years. And then, boom, all the white beads end up on top in a layer and all the black beads end up on bottom. Is that what's gonna happen? Well, maybe I have it more, give it more time. I'll shake it, I'll shake and, okay, I'll, I'll try again. And then I'll try again, and I'll try again. And every, it, it, what I need though is all the black beads to be on the bottom, all the white beads to be on the top, and I need that to happen thousands of times in a row every time I shake it. Uh, that's, so this is what we're talking about. There, there has to be some sort of a unnatural, because natural is gonna produce the, this random mixture this random distribution, but we need an unnaturally sorted um, distribution of just to get the building blocks, just to get the handedness exactly correct so we can have actual DNA. Well, we can't get the building blocks and we can't get them the right chirality, um, so the question is doubly done. Natural processes do not substitute. But now we have another problem, the water paradox. Okay, so step, uh, uh, impossible step seven, 
This is three out of seven. We're making progress, guys. You're getting smarter by the minute. Well, the chemicals that make life happen in a cell. Uh, you've got to have water in order to bring these chemicals together. There's a medium that they travel on. That's water. Because that's how chemistry happens, the chemistry of life. You need water to bring these molecules together so that chemistry, the right kind of chemistry, can happen. Problem being, that same water destroys the chemicals of life. <laughs> and so, how do actual cells f function in water? Well, they're pre-designed, they're all, they're all built to be able to function uh, in, in, in a watery environment. And when, the, when that water breaks down these biochemicals, then the cell is already pre-designed to make replacement molecules to fix or replace those molecules that water has destroyed. Anyway, so we end up with this paradox where you, you have to have water to have life, but you can't have water because it destroys life. And so that we need a solution to the water paradox. The Lord Jesus provided, in my opinion, a solution. Uh, for example, here's one way he helped solve that problem, and it's a class of proteins called chaperonins. Here's a model of one that you could download for free on that interweb place. And what it is, it's like a, you, you, it's like sort of like a football. And um, as a new protein is uh, is emerging from the protein factory. By the way, th th so this is a ribbon diagram, and it's um, uh, it, it it's based on um, cryo uh, electron microscopy, and and so basically what that does is it's high resolution imaging that gives you the position of every atom. So we know within a, a, a narrow range, the position of every, I mean, we're measuring in angstroms, like really tiny. And so um, you build up all those atoms and you put them in the sequence of, of amino acids that made up of atoms. And, we, and so this is good science, very good descriptive science to know the shape of this thing. Well, what is it doing in our cells? Well, as, a, as certain proteins are being born from the protein production facility, uh, if water molecules surround them, they never will form into the right final shape. And life depends on them forming into the right final shape. It's kind of like, um, uh, I'm thinking of an analogy on the fly and it's not working very well for me. Uh, let's say you have to have a blender to do a recipe and uh, you know the blade is on the bottom instead of inside I mean it's you've got to have the right shape any tool is like this the right the tool the parts and pieces of that tool have to be the right size shape and strength in order to do what they're designed and intended to do that's exactly what we have here with this molecule chaperone because what it does is as the protein is newly emerging it, it gets inserted into this into this capsule into the interior of this uh, football shaped molecule. And what's happening on the interior of it? Well, it's, it keeps that newly emerging protein from getting exposed to the water that would make it the wrong shape. In other words, this guy makes sure that the next protein turns into the right shape so, it, so, so that our cells can function even in the midst of water. You gotta have chaperonins, guys. Isn't that cool? Your cells have exactly what they need and uh, we didn't even know it. And here's the Lord Jesus taking care of us in ways that we didn't necessarily know unless we've studied chaperonins. So certain proteins need chaperonins in order to form the right shape, but it turns out that how do you make the chaperonin itself? Well, you have to have those proteins already in order to make the chaperonin. So we have another which came first chicken egg problem that uh, the only way to solve it that we know of is for someone to foresee this problem and to craft a solution for it. So this is totally not natural. Supernatural is what I'm starting to think. Uh, what about the next problem? Uh, Biopolymer reproduction. You gotta get these things to, uh, um, to copy, make copies. Oh, this is, here's a book, a whole book on this. Uh, how chemistry becomes biology. I mean, with a book title like that, you just, and if you, don't, if you don't study the issue and you're not careful, you'll just think, oh, chemistry becomes biology. <laughs> but it's all hype. It doesn't actually do that. It talks about um, molecular self-replication. Because if, if we can't get a whole cell yet, because we have to build the cell piece by piece, 
then maybe we can at least get a molecule to make copies of a molecule, and then we can have some sort of natural selection replacement of, a, of, a, of an actual designer uh, uh, selecting single molecules. And that's kind of the, that's kind of the idea. So there's a report um, published in Journal Cell. Um, talks about highly efficient self-replicating RNA enzymes. Uh-oh. That means we don't need a god, don't need a creator, because molecules can copy themselves. Um, and then, so what do we do? We, <laughs> we get confused and we run away. No, we, we read the technical journal and we look at what they're saying and we look critically at what they did and we recognize that when we see what they actually did, and I'll illustrate it for you, that we, we, we kind of go, oh, that's all it was. <laughs> That sure was a, a big title uh, for, for what you did. So they, they sequenced a ribozyme. Okay, ribozyme, it's, it's like an enzyme um, made of RNA. And so here's the sequence of their ribozyme. Start, starts in the uh, top right, and uh, it's, it's like 50 some odd um, uh, nucleobases. And they already knew, you know, because cells have these things, they already knew the general shape and the general sequence that they needed this thing to be. So they built one of these, put it in a test tube. Then they built another one, but they split it in half. They made substrate A, substrate B. And then they put it in a test tube, put them all together, and boom, ribozyme on the one side makes ribozyme on the other side. It would be like you start with a car and you cut it in half. And then you have another car. You put them in a test tube, and the one car bumps the other car into place. Voila! An enzyme has made itself. <laughs> Not at all. All they've really shown is that it takes a great deal of engineering, chemical engineering, intelligence, foresight, intent, genius, specification in order to get even this because this is totally not natural. It's happening in the test tube. It's happening with, with the parameters that these guys have crafted and created. In other words, they're showing, that, they're showing that you need a creator to create these enzymes, which is what they did when they created these, these enzymes. So it's not self-replicating. Um, you gotta have the enzyme to start the enzyme in their, in their case. Uh, let's skip a few because of time. <clears throat> and let's look at, uh, oh, DNA repair. Did you know that your DNA is constantly falling apart? And the older you are, the more aware you are of this fact, <laughs> I would think. But you have to have a repair. Um, you have to have repair this because it's constantly getting damaged. Um, and so uh, there, our cells have DNA repair mechanisms. Here's, uh, here's just one of, of the 12 DNA repair pathways outlined on on this uh, slide here. And so look at the, look, okay, so the top is like damaged DNA. That's an illustration of damaged DNA. Uh, and then there's an arrow. Do you see where the arrow is? And it says glycosylase. Uh, so, so you have to have, so at each arrow, you have a little robot that has a specific job. And the first robot clamps onto the DNA and detects that there's an error here. And then the next enzyme, breaks apart the DNA. And then you have another enzyme that brings in, that recruits a helper. And then you, it's so, so in other words, it's a step-by-step -step editing program. And every arrow is a, is a represents a, um, a, an enzyme, a little, a little robot that has a specific, and this is the simplest of the 12, just so I can fit it on a page. But there's, there's even one of these uh, um, DNA repair systems, and there's hundreds of enzymes total that are constantly scouring your DNA right now and repairing it and repairing it and repairing it, keeping it up, up to date so that, you, so that your cells don't, um, don't lose that critical information that keeps, them, that, that keeps us going. Uh, but there's one that will take a, a clamp onto DNA, and then it will spool out a loop of DNA clamp on to another piece, just imagine, imagine my DNA out here, and then it sends an electron down that DNA, and if it receives that electron, because it's conductive, then it says check, and it spools out another loop. But if the electron doesn't come back, it's, it sends out a signal saying there's a break somewhere because we didn't receive that electron. I mean, 
It's just mind-bogglingly complicated and precise. And wow, who gets the credit for this? But we have to have DNA repair. Um, but the thing is, we need DNA to get repaired. We need these DNA repair machines. But where do we find the coding instructions to build the very DNA repair machines? That's an actual question. <laughs> where do you think we find the coding instructions that code for the production of those DNA repair machines, those enzymes? It's on the DNA. So the DNA needs the repair, and the repair needs the DNA. In other words, they both stand or fall together. This is an all or nothing system. And all or nothing systems arise, every time we see them arise, by intent, by design, on purpose, from a smart person. Okay, let's look. Membranes. Now, when I was at college, back in the 1800s, my, my professors, taught me, um, my microbiology professor, oh, he was an odd guy. Um, he, and he, and he's, with a straight face, he's telling us that he believes that chemicals uh, came together to form the first cell. As a microbiologist, he's telling us this. And, he, and here's the analogy he gave us. He said, I, it came to me when I was, I had poured some, um, some cream into my coffee and I stirred the coffee and then I saw these little bubbles form and rise up to the top of my coffee mug. Then I thought, ah, that's it. That's all you need for life. And this guy is telling us this with a straight face. Um, and w yes, oil separates from water, but that is the furthest thing from life. That's like saying, oh, I saw a broken nail on the side of the road and therefore, Houses form themselves. Um, here's, here's, what, uh, uh, here's what happens when oil separates itself. Sometimes if you have a certain kind of oil called phospholipid, um, they will um, they'll form a, mem not a membrane, but they'll form a bilayer. But um, it turns out that membranes in cells are way, 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 way more complicated than just a phospholipid bilayer, an actual membrane in an actual cell. Um, has to keep protons inside. It has to, it has to, um, yeah, so, so, so the phospholipid bilayer, the little, the little, um, they're called coacervates or, or, or vesicles that form in your coffee mug, the, uh, they're impervious, like protons can't get through, but we need the protons to get through. So you have to have channels to get those protons through, and you need to get nutrients in and waste out. And uh, if you have a hole big enough to get the waste out, that hole's gonna be big enough to, uh, to, have, to have everything else leak. So you have to have gates. So you have to have gates. And so actual m membranes have hundreds of protein, 142 uh, proteins in the minimum, the simplest cell, mycoplasma. Okay, so that's a real, so you have to have a whole suite of proteins and uh, uh, other molecules that, including cholesterols that hold the thing together. So it's the furthest thing from a, a drop of oil. It's actually um, very unnatural. So anyway, you've got to have a protein. You've got to have proteins to make your membrane. But it turns out you need the membrane in order to have the facility to make the proteins that make up the membrane. Are you with me on this? It's again, it stands together. In other words, it's an all or it's an all at once design in, in these little bitty, little bitty systems. Well, we're getting close to the end of our 12 impossible steps. We're skipping most, some of them, um, but this is my favorite. Okay, this is energy. And, and I remember when I was getting my master's in biotechnology, it was just basically biochemistry. And I, was, I had to read the textbook on biochemistry. And um, I was reading all about the ATP molecule. There it is in, 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 in ball form uh, with, with your adenosine triphosphate. There's three phosphates. It turns out that third phosphate is really energetic and it likes to pop off. And when it does, it releases energy. And there's these machines that harvest that energy to do work in the cell. And it's kind of like the batteries of the cell. Um, so here's your cell. Uh, this is a, 
a eukaryotic cell as opposed to bacteria, which is a prokaryotic cell. And in these eukaryotic cells, like the ones that make up your body, we have these cute little energy factories called what? The mitochondria. No. That was the name of our um, biology club. We are the mitochondria. <laughs> mitochondria, there it is uh, on the bottom of the screen there. And it's got these fold, folded membranes inside. Well, well uh, we have an electron micrograph of a mitochondria showing these folded membranes. So there's what's happening on these folded membranes. Let's zoom in using an illustration. Then um, this is the kind of illustration that, that was in my um, biology textbook when I was teaching this. So you've got an outer membrane, see it? it and so that's important, you have to have, and it's not just a phospholipid bilayer, it's a, it's a membrane in there which, with, with a hundred and some odd proteins with gates to allow certain things in and certain things out. It's required that you have all these gates. And then you have an inner membrane. And then you have little folds. And so it turns out that the inner membrane, this is where the action happens. And if, if, you, so if, if, I, if I were to, um, okay, let's just, let's just zoom in on one of these folds. How about I do this? Laser pointer. Oh, that's a big fat laser. Okay, let's say I'm, I'm zooming in on this fold right here. Are you guys weren't ready to take a trip with me and zoom in? I like tripping. Okay, so, here, so here's that fold. Now on that fold, we have a, a, a linked sequence of enzymes that are, that are uh, um, embedded partly in this membrane. Okay, this enzyme here, it pumps out a, a hydrogen or a proton. Okay, this enzyme pumps out another one and this enzyme pumps out another one so that you have this space out here, intermembrane space, and it's getting packed with protons, hydrogen atoms. Well, this is critical to life. You've got to have this. So what happens is, is here's an electron micrograph of this right here. This is my favorite protein in the world, ATP synthase. And, um, and so this is, this is a, an image uh, of ATP synthases embedded on a mitochondrial membrane. And why is it my favorite protein? Because the protons, as they, as they flow through a specific channel to them, uh, both charge-wise and, and size-wise, to go right through this, this channel, then it, it turns a turbine um, with, which connects to, to rocking cams on the top. So here, here's the turbine. It's got a stator out here. Um, here's a rotor. And then the axle is inside here. It turns out the axle is bent like this. Um, and so as that axle rotates at 9,000 RPM, it, it pushes, it deforms the rocking cams. There's six of them at the top here. It deforms those rocking cams into and out of position. And so we have a chemical gradient, proton gradient, which turns into mechanical energy, which be by the nature of its design, this machine um, catalyzes the formation of ATP. So ADP and a phosphate come together in this little notch, this little cleft designed to accommodate them right here. Um, and, and, then, and then you get ATP. And half your body weight every day gets converted to ATP and back to ADP. So, you, so these guys are constantly running day and night. You have to have this. Even, um, even bacteria that don't use ATP for their energy or don't use oxygen, uh, they use uh, sulfur-based energy, they still have to have ATP synthase in order to maintain the proper proton gradients in their cell. So every cell that we know of in, in, the, in the world has this molecular motor, this machine running. Uh, it's just fantastic. Now, I and I remember reading about that and learning about that in grad school, and I, and I already was convinced of a creator by that time, but when I saw that, my respect for the Lord Jesus took another bounce. And I just thought, Lord, I knew you took care of me, but I didn't know you took care of me that intimately and that precisely. And uh, anyway, so I hope you join me in elevating your praise of our creator that way. But you gotta have ATP synthase, which needs ATP in order to build the ATP synthase itself, right? But ATP needs ATP synthase. So it's another chicken and egg. You have to have both the machine and the machines that make the machines 
and the energy to produce uh, all those machines. You've got to have you got to have it all in place all at once. And uh, well, we're almost we're almost there. Um, let's look at DNA copying. So here's a little video showing DNA getting copied called DNA uh, polymerase. That's the name of this enzyme complex. And so the DNA spools in, um, helicase unwinds it uh, or, or denatures it. And then um, you can see how marvelous this machine is to make sure the DNA is copied in high fidelity. Um, and so you've got to have that protein. DNA copying needs 25 proteins, but those 25 <laughs> DNA copiers, they need DNA themselves because the, the, the coding instructions for them is already on the DNA. Same with proteins. Here's a protein being manufactured by a, a ribosome inside of a cell. And the, the details there, it's very precise, uh, uh, bringing in the amino acids in sequence. And of course, you need the protein. The proteins need proteins and RNA, but then the proteins and RNA need the proteins to make the ribosome. And so it all stands, it all stands together. So we have an energy system that depends on DNA. Uh, um, um, and, and the protein synthesis depends on DNA. It also depends on the energy. And the cell membrane depends on the proteins. And it also depends on the energy. So we have interdependence. Whenever we see interdependent matching parts, what do we think? Design. Actual design. Actual designer. So um, natural tendency is death, decay, and... Uh, an origin of life, abiogenesis um, people, they want to pretend like that's, um, that's not the case. So these 12 impossible steps uh, mark out for us um, new confidence that when Jesus said this, uh, or when, the, when Mark said this, but Jesus looked at them and said, with men is impossible. Like we can't even make the building blocks, let alone the, the structure of a cell. I mean, each cell is like a, a city in all that it accomplishes at, a, at the smallest imaginable level. With the man, it's impossible. We can't do it. But not with God. With, with God, all things are possible. You know what else is possible? If he can make physical life, you can bet he can make spiritual life. So he, he is really, really trustworthy. Um, and he is able, he is able to save us from our sins and give us everlasting life. We have confidence in that because of what he's done to make physical life. I encourage you to sign up for Acts and Facts to have more information like this. I want to, <clears throat> want to just quickly mention our book, Di uh, Creation Basics and Beyond. We consider this the household um, uh, reference book. So it, it answers a lot of creation questions, even about carbon dating in the Ice Age. But if you want to learn more about this particular topic, The Stairway to Life is our flagship book. And I learned so much more, even, at, even with a a master's degree in biochem, I learned a lot more uh, about what the latest uh, arguments are out there from this book, The Stairway to Life. And with, um, and with this information in this book, similar to what I sp spoke on today, we have more confidence than ever that the Lord Jesus did it. He is the creator. Only he could have done it. And we give him the, the, the credit. Okay, thanks everybody. All right, let's thank Dr. Thomas one more time. That is so encouraging, and hopefully you're left with just an idea of the complexity of life and the complexity of the origin of life and how only God... In Acts 3, it refers to Jesus Christ as the author of life, and he really is that, and he deserves the honor and glory for that. So hopefully... That's one thing that you walk away from that um, presentation with. Just a couple other notes. Dr. Thomas mentioned one or two ways you can keep up with ICR research information in some of those books. Another way you can do that is by signing up for our free magazine, Acts and Facts. There are several ways to sign up for that. One of them is, Dave, can you wave back there? Dave is back there next to the Acts and Facts sign up page. You can sign up for that over there. There's also a station next to the Discovery Center front desk. You can feel free to sign up there. And there are also ways to sign up online. So feel free to sign up for that just to stay up to date. And it's completely free. We do it as part of our ministry um, just to stay um, aware of some of the research that we're doing here at ICR. Just a couple other notes. We're just going to take a brief um, break.
break right now. Let's see, it's 11.02. We're going to be back in here at 11.15 um, to start the next presentation. If you wanted to go ahead and try to get some tickets for the exhibit hall and planetarium, feel free to do that if, there, if there's no line at this point especially, or you can do that on your phone as well. Um, and just as a reminder, this event here at the Discovery Center, these are always an encouragement. ICR also does events at local churches and um, other organizations and beyond all over the country. And occasionally we've even done some out of the country. So if you want to look into having an event at your location, whether it's a school, a church, another organization, just look up icr.org slash events. And you'll be able to learn about other events that are coming up across the country, as well as ways that you can sign up to potentially have ICR come to and have an event at your location. Um, we're just going to take a brief break. I'll see you at 1115. When did dinosaurs live? Where do they fit in the Bible? And how did they go extinct? If you have questions about dinosaurs, join us March 14th through 18th at the ICR Discovery Center for Dinosaur Week. Learn about these remarkable reptiles and the fascinating fossils they left behind from ICR's experts and special guest, David Mickelson of Everything Fossil. Experience interactive, hands-on fossil preparation and casting workshops, unearth dinosaur bones at our fossil dig tables, enjoy our fossil petting zoo, and marvel at our full-size dinosaur fossil exhibit. Visit icr.org slash events to plan your visit.
When did dinosaurs live? Where do they fit in the Bible? And how did they go extinct? If you have questions about dinosaurs, join us March 14th through 18th at the ICR Discovery Center for Dinosaur Week. Learn about these remarkable reptiles and the fascinating fossils they left behind from ICR's experts and special guest David Mickelson of Everything Fossil. Experience interactive, hands-on fossil preparation and casting workshops, unearth dinosaur bones at our fossil dig tables, enjoy our fossil petting zoo, and marvel at our full-size dinosaur fossil exhibit. Visit icr.org slash events to plan your visit. All right, welcome back. So, 
Just as a reminder, you can text your questions. And for those who just joined us, this will be new to you. We are having a Q&A after all of the sessions are done with our speakers this afternoon. For that Q&A, you can feel free to text questions to, drum roll please, 833-626-2572. Again, that's 833-626-2572. Two five seven two, and you can text your questions to that. We might not be able to get to all of them, but we would love to be able to answer as many of the questions that come through as we can. So, an introduction to our next speaker, Dr. Tim Clary. Dr. Clary has his Master of Science in Geology from the University of Wyoming. He also has his Master of Science in Hydrogeology from Western Michigan University and his PhD in Geology also from Western Michigan University. He worked as an exploration geologist at Chevron USA Incorporated and he was developing oil drilling prospects with them and analyzing assets and lease purchases. He served as full professor and geosciences chair at Delta College in Michigan for 17 years before leaving in 2013 to join the research science staff here at ICR. He had earlier conducted some research with us before then. He now serves as ICR's director of research. He has published many papers on various aspects of the Rocky Mountains and has authored two college laboratory books. He is also the author of Dinosaurs, Marvels of God's Design, and Carved in Stone, and was a co-author of Parks Across America, which I highly recommend, by the way. That's one of our more recent books. We do have in the bookstore here, and Human Origins. He also contributed to Guide to Dinosaurs and Creation Basics and Beyond. He and his wife, Renee, also co-authored a couple of children's books for ICR, Big Plans for Henry, and Henry Explores the New World. Please welcome with me ICR's Director of Research, Dr. Tim Clary. Thank you, Lauren. Thank you, Thank you very much for that uh, warm welcome. Uh, being from the north, it's not so warm up there right now. Uh, it's warmer down here, so we'll see how this goes. You might be wondering why we're talking about geology in the middle of a biology session. And so, but it's very, very important because the deep time idea that came about from the early geologists is really the problem. And that's one of the things Darwin used when he developed his theory of evolution. He needed deep time. So we'll see how that kind of work fits right in here. But this is Sikar Point over in Scotland, if you're wondering uh, where this really kind of be began. So as I was mentioning a little bit, there's two pillars really of conventional science and deep science, evolutionary science, wherever you want to call it. There's, there's the pillar of evolution where you have to have you know, ancestry and descent from a simple form of life, which has been be debunked from that last talk. And then you also have to have deep time. You can't have one without the other. You have to hide this evolutionary story behind, well, it could happen over millions of years. It could happen over billions of years. And so they need deep time. So that was very, very important. But where did deep time come from? Deep time originated, in the more recent time anyway, with a, a, a book by Malay, who actually turned his name backwards, and it was published after he died because he was afraid of you know, the ruckus it would cause. Uh, but he claimed in his book that the Earth is about two billion years old. And then came along James Hutton, who's often known as the father of deep time. And that's where he saw that Sikar point. And he realized there's rocks laying kind of flat on top and rocks tilted down below. Because there must have been immense amounts of time in between. That's why he talked about uh, the immense amount of time. He started talking about millions of years. And then he said, there's no deluge needed. So he was trying to steer us away from the biblical story of the flood and say, we can explain everything except what he called uniformitarianism, where everything's uniform. Everything we see happening today, slow processes today, slow erosion, slow rivers, all these processes can explain everything we see on Earth. And he said, that must have taken an immense amount of time. And then Charles Lyell came along a little bit later in time, and he wrote a book, a couple of books, that explained uniformitarianism. He actually used that word, that everything's uniform, these processes are uniform. And that's what's really entrenched in geology today. This concept of deep time is very, very important because they don't believe there's a global flood. They don't believe there ever was a global flood. But yet you just look down, you see thousands of feet of rock below your feet in most places in the world filled with fossils that could only have occurred during the flood. But Lyell's book was very, very important because he was used by Charles Darwin. Charles Darwin took his books along on the HMS Beagle. And Darwin wrote this later. He said, I always feel as if my books came half out of Lyell's brains. 
So without that deep time, there wouldn't be no evolutionary theory. He says, for I've always thought that the great merit of the principles of geology, which is the book Lyle wrote, was that it altered the whole tone of one's mind. So without this concept of deep time, that pillar of deep time, you lose that theory of evolution. You don't have time for evolution to occur. You can't hide behind the shroud in this fantasy world of like, if given enough time, anything can happen. And as you saw in the previous talk, it's too complex for it just to happen. But you need deep time. Ernest Henkel said this, an atheist in 1906. He was already bragging, our science of evolution won its greatest triumph when at the beginning of the 20th century, its powerful opponents, the churches, became reconciled to it and endeavored to bring their dogmas into line with it. This is when you saw things like the gap theory coming out in the Schofield Study Bible. The idea is that you had to have deep time somehow fit into the Bible because that's what scientists were arguing for. They tried to explain it away by geology that you need deep time for all these geological features that we see. When in fact, that's not true at all. And unfortunately, I put sadly on here because it's, it is rather sad. Sad that many influential leaders, even church leaders, deny the global flood and teach a local flood in an old earth because they feel they have to reconcile to science, what they believe is science. But science is really not very scientific. There is science that is, but a lot of conventional science is not very scientific. They're the ones that believe that we came from no life. They're the ones that believe that somehow inorganic minerals can somehow create life on its own, you just saw. So let's look at the rocks. What does the Great Flood explain? Does it explain all the rock layers that we see in the world? Or most of the rock layers we see in the world? I believe it does. The best explanation for these thousands and thousands and thousands of feet of rock we see all over the world, we drill oil from, get coal from, the best explanation is the flood, and you'll see this here in a minute. Do the rock layers really need deep time to be deposited? That's one of the questions I'm going to examine today. Is there evidence of deep time between the layers? And we're going to look at that as well. So we're going to look at a little bit, a little bit out of my flood talk, three truths of the flood or the Bible, because if the flood is true, then the Bible is true. We believe they're both true. Uh, the first, that there was a global flood. The second, we'll look at it was a very catastrophic flood. It wasn't a very tranquil flood. It didn't slowly fill up your bathtub. It was a very violent flood. And we see that in the fossils. And thirdly, we'll look at it was a recent flood. There's a lot of evidence that this flood didn't happen even millions of years ago, if there was a flood. It happened just thousands of years ago, about 4,500 years ago, like the Bible tells us. And that's what the evidence supports. Second Peter 3, God told Peter to write this. He said uh, he knew, God knew there would be scoffers in the last days. He said, there shall come the last days scoffers, walking after their own lusts. For this they willingly are ignorant, willingly ignorant, that by the word of God the heavens are of old, the earth standing out of water, in the water, whereby the world that then was, being overflowed with water, perished. So he says they're not stupid, he says they, but they're willingly ignorant. They willingly ignore the evidence. They willingly ignore the evidence of the flood right below their feet. Yeah, I can see in Noah's day there was never a flood. People didn't believe there was going to be a flood because there was no evidence of it. Here we have all the evidence we need. That's what I get to examine. And I'm going to show you some of that evidence today. All the evidence we need for the global flood is right there before our feet. You can go to the canyons all over the world. You can see it. Even conventional scientists accept six floods. This is the first flood of North America. That's North America supposedly back in the, what's called the Cambrian. And the second flood, third flood, fourth flood, fifth flood, sixth flood. So they believe in six floods. They just don't believe there was a global flood. They don't believe it flooded everything. We'll see there is evidence that it did flood everything. This is their sea level curve. I hope it shows up here. This is where sea level, this is today's sea level here in the middle. And you can see they believe it goes up really high and then it went down, went up really high, went down. And there's basically, and then it went up really high again here about the time the dinosaurs were buried in the flood. So they believe there's two big peaks. But in my research, we'll see there's really only one big peak. There's one progressive flood, and that's what the rocks really support. And I actually presented this at a conventional geology conference prior to COVID, and the audience was kind of like, huh. And I said, we've been lying to our students all these years about this high sea level down here. There really isn't any evidence of this, as we will see. The rocks don't support it. So this really what we see is one increase, higher than higher than higher than higher yet until we reach a peak and then it went down. And that's what the Bible describes. This fits exactly with what the Bible describes. And you'll see the data that supports this here in just a minute. We used real rock data. I started studying this about 10 years ago. 
And uh, it's been the greatest research I've ever done in my life because it really is showing God's word is true. And I had the greatest job. I don't know why I get paid. <laughs> oh, my boss is back. Oh, I didn't mean to say that out loud. But it's, I, I would do this for, you know. But it's only because I am being paid enough that I can do this, that I have the time, because of supporters like you, that gives me the time to do this. And so my job is to show you that God's word is true by showing there really was a global flood. And that's what I really enjoy doing. Uh, but we're really looking at observable data, and this is how science is supposed to be done. You're supposed to look at rocks and then make your interpretations. You're not supposed to just make things up. Unfortunately, many people already have their minds made up and they go try to prove that called verifiable science, verification science. They already think they already know the answer. That's really not how science should be done. You're supposed to follow the data. So I really did. I just started following the data. But I did assume that God's word is true. But I said, let's see what the rocks really show. So I've gathered over 3,000 geologic columns. That's if you were to drill a well right here down to the crust, how many thousands of feet you go through, how much you know, sand, limestone, whatever the case is, all the way down. All over the world, I've done five continents now, and I'm working on the sixth continent, Australia. Uh, so you've got a pretty good data set here, pretty much the entire world that I've been looking at. We keep track of the rock types and those mega sequences, those chapters of the flood, whatever you want to call them. We kind of lump them into these big, these big flood events. But the floods kept getting higher and higher, as we'll see. So the Bible tells us this. In the 600 year of Noah's life were all the fountains of the great deep broken up, and the windows of heaven were opened. And I believe at this point, this is what initiated the tectonic plates of the world. So we didn't have any tectonic plates, really. I don't think the way God made the original earth, but he broke it all up miraculously, or whatever the case was. I don't know if he needed a, any sort of asteroid to hit the earth, some people suggest, but I think he just cracked open all these plates all over the earth. And then the plates started to move because of differences in density, things we don't need to get into. But keep in mind, Earth is the only planet in our solar system that has plates, these tectonic plates that actually moved. Other planets and some of the moons of the planets actually have cracks on them because they cooled and contracted, but they don't have plates that actually moved. And so Earth is the only planet that has these plates. And geologists, conventional geologists, don't know when the plates started to move. There's a big debate about that, but the Bible tells us pretty clear, a pretty good indication that the fountains of the deep burst all over the earth, cracks opened up all over the earth. We see magma that shot out of a lot of those cracks and an unknown amount of water as well. So we don't know exactly how much water came out, but uh, some water obviously because it did rain upon the earth for 40 days and 40 nights as well. So here's what was happening and here's my sea level curve again. Uh, we'll look at these first three sequences, what was going on. We see basically it was a rise in sea level that was taking place. So you started this initial rise and it's because you start to move plates and we saw the effects of that plate movement still today. There's still plate movement this much per year. But that's not what was doing during the flood. John Baumgartner modeled that you would have runaway subduction under the right conditions of cooler, cold ocean crust prior to the flood. And once you start to crack it open, immediately rocks start to subduct. And they're going to the earth like they're still doing on the west coast of North America. If you're from California, Washington, those areas, uh, particularly northern California, it's still active. There's still potential there for a large earthquake, just like the one we saw in Turkey. Turkey's on one of these subduction zone uh, boundary areas as well. And so that's why they had that unfortunately devastating earthquake uh, a few days ago. But you can actually see this. You can still image into the earth. We can see that these slabs going down are still here. And they go way down here in North America all the way across. They've been doing this for quite some time. And notice they're still kind of the same color all the way down. And that color represents density. And that the density comes from the temperature of those slabs. Those slabs, and we've written many articles on this, those slabs are still cold. So they're down here way deep in the earth, all the way down, here's the core. They go way down deep in the earth, and they're still cold. How can they be cold if they've been moving this much per year over millions of years? These 60-mile thick slabs should have heated up. This is kind of verification that John Bob Gardner was right. There was runaway subduction, real rapid plate movement during that flood year. And we may come back to that a little bit later. Oh, here's a few more examples. Uh, this is the one they show a lot from the Tonga plate over in the Pacific Ocean. You can see the same density. Here's all the earthquakes that happen. We can follow these all the way down. You can see everywhere they shoot these things across subduction zones in the Caribbean or wherever along the Andes, you see these cold slabs deep in the earth. Cold slabs deep in the earth. Folks, that tells you those went down there fast. It's like sticking your hand in the oven with an oven mitt on. 
Leave it in there long enough, it's going to get hot. And you leave these slabs down there deep in the earth where the temperatures are a couple thousand degrees Celsius, 60 miles of rock is going to heat up pretty quick. And we're still seeing their cold. So that tells us this happened recently, that the flood really wasn't that long ago, and the rocks did move down into the earth quickly. But when you start to move plates, of course, you get tsunamis, and this is a picture of one going over a seawall in Japan. Uh, but you get these tsunami waves. It might have been 100, 200, 300 foot high during the flood year. Things that we'd never witnessed since, because today we're only moving plates this much per year. And there's sudden rapid movements. You move the ocean up and down, and that makes tsunamis. But during the flood year, there might have been hundreds and hundreds of these happening every day, pushing water back and forth. And so what we see is the first flooding that goes across the continents from those movements of the plates. We see the Sauk mega sequence, it's called, or chapter one. We'll kind of go through these six chapters as we go along. Uh, but here, what, what you see, this is what's there today. This is the Sauk mega sequence. So wherever it's blue or colored, that's where those, there's rocks there. But you notice most of Africa's high and dry. Most of South America's high and dry. Canada, high and dry. Greenland. I didn't put the plates back together into the Pangea-like configuration. I thought it's best just to leave them where they are today. But this is where the Sauk is there today. You notice a lot of Asia and Europe is still high and dry. Now, Australia's not done. so. It isn't that Australia never floods in my model. It's just that it's not done. So everything else will get colored except for Australia. We're working on that. But notice a lot of the world didn't flood. You notice this is very common. We'll see the next sequence. It, it's almost the same. So don't blink because this is the sock. This is where the Cambrian explosion comes in. All of a sudden, at this level, there's life in fossils buried all over the world at the same time. And below it is that great unconformity which is a big erosional surface, which geologists still can't explain. It's all over the world at the same place, right below where the rocks first come in. So you had a lot of erosion, then you deposit this layer over parts of the Earth. And this is the layer that contains you know, all those different phyla. Almost every age, every animal phyla, pretty much, is represented in that sudden Cambrian explosion. So the evolutionists try to say, well, that was 500 million years ago. There was, you know, we don't know why everything happened so quickly, but suddenly life was all over the place. And they still can't explain it, but it's the initial layers of the flood that explains it best. So here's the next one. Did you guys blink? It looks almost the same. A little bit more in South America, but pretty much North Africa is all you get. You go to the next one. It's pretty much the same. So you see three layers stacked on top of each other, representing the, the first three sequences, Sauk, Tippecanoe, and Kaskaskia. All over the world, they all pretty much do the same thing. You still see major areas of Africa, high and dry. A lot of the Asia, a lot of Europe, a lot of North America is still high and dry, a lot of South America is still high and dry. So you didn't flood everything right away, and that's why my sea level curve doesn't show major flooding. Like the conventional geologists try to show, they don't do this kind of stuff. We're the only ones in the world that are doing this research. No one else is looking at the global picture of the rocks across every continent. They might work on one continent here or there, one continent here or there, or if they are doing it, they're not publishing it. Maybe some of the oil companies are. But I work for an oil company, and we will just, here's your little area, work your area. Don't go any beyond you know, that area. So a lot of the oil and gas geologists, they really like this research because they get to see the global picture, which they don't get to do. But I don't want to brag, but Dr. G wants me to tell you that we're the only ones doing this. You know, and it's taken 10 years to get this far. So it's, you know, it's your support that allows this to get done. But what we find in those first three sequences, oddly enough, is we see almost all marine fossils. Sock, Tippecanoe, Kaskaskia, those first three chapters, all the way up to about what's called the Pennsylvanian. All those rocks that we just saw are only flooding, I think, shallow seas. That's why it's the same area over and over and over, and the rest of the world stays high and dry because they're a little higher elevation. So let's move on to chapters four and five, which I think might be days 40 to day 150 of the flood. And the Bible tells us this, and the flood was 40 days upon the earth, and the waters increased and bear up the ark. And according to my Hebrew experts here at ICR, it means it launched the ark. So waves hit it, and the ark just kind of didn't slowly start to float. It was launched. And the waters prevailed and were increased greatly upon the earth. The waters prevailed exceedingly upon the earth. And all the high hills under the whole heaven were covered. And it goes on to say by day 150 of the flood, you know, a full five months or so into the flood before everything was covered. So it was not a very quick flood. It was 150 days to reach the highest point, the one over the top. And we're, we're only partway there. So let's look at these days. These are the days where things got really bad. 
So if you were a human or an animal living on land, you probably weren't being affected as much except for the rain. And the flooding was mostly in areas that you didn't live anyway. They're just burying marine critters over and over and over on top of each other, more and more marine critters all over the world. But now the water starts to go higher and higher, like the Bible tells us, and we start to see a change in the fossils that are being buried. And the humans are probably starting to go, huh, this isn't going away. Maybe I should listen to Noah. And remember, only eight people believe there's going to be a flood. Noah, his wife, and Noah's three sons and their wives. Not even their relatives. You know, not even their mothers, if there's you know, Noah's mother and mother or anything. None of the, nobody else came. They didn't believe there was going to be a flood. Eight people. Eight people walked through that door, that door of salvation. If they walked through and God shut the door, their fates were sealed if you weren't on the ark. All the rest of the people on the earth, maybe a billion people, we don't know. A billion people might have died in the flood. Only eight people survived. And the geneticists tell us that we all kind of come, as humans, we all come from three branches, three different discrete branches of DNA. And it comes back to the three sons of Noah. But Jesus is our salvation. He's opened that door of salvation again. Just like in the days of Noah, that salvation would have been to walk through that door of the ark. There only eight people were found righteous. And all the two of every kind, God brought those all to the ark. Yet Jesus... God himself took on human form. The God who created everything. The God who was there for the judgment of the flood. The guy who was there. Jesus was there the whole time. He came to earth, died, and opened up the door of salvation for all of us. Not just the Jewish people, but the Gentiles. Everybody in the world now has the opportunity for salvation. We just have to believe what Jesus did, who Jesus is. That he really is the Son of God. He is God. Part of the Trinity. And salvation is there if we just believe. It's that simple. The Epsaroka Omega sequence comes next. Some people say Epsaroka, but it's up to you. It depends where you're from. My years in Wyoming messed me up, so I'll, I'll blame it on that. But sea level continued to rise, as the Bible tells us. It's seemingly higher, went higher, went higher yet. And now we're starting to flood the land. We're creating more ocean crust. So if you look at the ocean crust, this is a map of the age of the ocean crust. Of course, these are in millions of years, if you look these up. But the, we believe these are all relative. The red stuff is the youngest, right along the ridges today, where it's moving this much per year. But during the flood year, it was moving this fast per second, according to John Baumgunner's research. And that's what the, again, those rocks deep in the Earth's mantle support, that there was rapid plate movement. So here's what we see. This is the, again, the younger rocks here in red. But the old stuff's green and blue. You can see green and blue over here in the edges as you separated the continents of North America from Africa, et cetera, I moved around the Pacific Ocean. But this new ocean crust is very hot. When you make new ocean crust today, it's ridges. But the whole ocean floor pushed up because it was all new. So if you have a lot of hot stuff, hate to bring this up because it's politically and it, you know, it's a big quandary it's about balloons. If you have a hot air balloon like the Chinese were launching. <laughs> See, I knew it was coming. If you have a hot air balloon, it rises while the ocean crust rises as well if it's hot. And that's why we see the ridges still today are even higher yet. The ridges are huge mountains, 10,000 foot high. They go through every ocean. Because that's where the ocean crust was formed during the flood. Now it's barely sputtering, so to speak. But it's still very hot. But the whole ocean pushes up. So if you're in your bathtub and suddenly the floor, bottom of the bathtub goes up, what happens to the water? It starts going up too. Water doesn't compress well. And so water will go up and up and up. The more ocean crust you made, the more the waves went higher and higher and higher. And that's exactly, I believe, the mechanism that God used to bring on the flood was making a whole new ocean seafloor. And that really kicked into gear. If you go back, the oldest ocean crust we see goes back to the Epsarico Omega sequence. So there wasn't a whole lot of movement before this. There wasn't a whole lot of new ocean crust being made. That's why you're just flooding shallow seas. But now you're starting to flood the land because the water gets pushed up higher and higher. We'll start to see this. And I'd be like waves coming across the land. But I mean, you got to imagine tsunami waves bigger than we've ever witnessed. Waves are probably 100, 200, 300 foot high coming in, taking away everything, taking away the vegetation. And that vegetation became coal seams. So we see the first appearance of extensive coal seams in the world all at the same time. It's called the Pennsylvanian system, or the upper Carboniferous if you're in the rest of the world, because of all the coal that's deposited there. And we see the first animals in great numbers from the land start showing up 
Before this, there was almost no land animals. And it's not a coincidence that the plants are being destroyed and buried, animals are being destroyed, they lived on land and buried, mixed with marine animals because the waves are coming in from the ocean. You always have mixing of land and marine. The obsterica sequence, you know, again, I think it's maybe day 40 to 90, I'm kind of guessing, but you see there's more coverage than we ever had before. You notice some of Africa is starting to flood now. And a lot more of Europe are starting to flood, a little bit more of South America. So we go up to the next sequence, which I think where we reach the peak, called the Zuni. This is about the end of the Cretaceous, if you're more familiar with those terms. This is the maximum coverage I see of all the sequences I've mapped out. This shows the maximum surface area still covered today. So this is after all the erosion, after the flood and everything else, we still see this much coverage. And you might say, but Tim, it doesn't cover everything. So how do you know it flooded everything? Well, there is the bathtub ring in places, as we'll see up in Canada. If you look at zoom in in North America, particularly we can look, we'll see there's a couple of dots up here, blue dots that they found by drilling in Hudson Bay and places in the Michigan Basin and Illinois Basin. There's evidence that these sediments were across this area. They can't just show up. They had to come in from the sides. You can't just drop a drone worth of sediment out there and say, oh, it's still there. You know, those had to come in from the outside. So even many of the conventional geologists will admit to, well, there had to be some way to get these sediments out here because they recognize they're out there as well. So I believe that's called, what I call the bathtub ring. So if you get out of your bathtub, you were really, really dirty like I used to be as a kid on the farm, you leave a dirty bathtub ring. You can see where the water was, and you can see where the water was. But you still might be scoffing, but going, well, I don't know about that. But here's what the Bible tells us. Day 150, this is what the world looked like. So why didn't it leave more sediment in Canada, for example? Or I could speak Canadian and say, why didn't it leave more sediment in Canada, eh? <laughs> so being from Michigan, I have to speak Canadian once in a while. It's, we have Tim Hortons, which apparently you guys are going to get down here soon. It went 15 cubits over the highest hills, the Bible tells us. It was about 23 feet. So that's all the higher the water went. But those waves were zipping across that 60 miles an hour, probably still. 23 feet of water was still zipping across, ripped it right down to the crust. So whatever was at those high elevations was stripped right off. God says he wiped them off the earth. That's probably where the humans were at. Humans and a lot of the mammals, the horses and camels. Things we find on top of the dinosaurs were stripped off from the highest hills and spread all over the earth. Many of them went into the oceans. But it didn't leave a lot behind. When you have 23 feet of water, you can't leave a lot of sediment behind. So that's why we don't find a lot of sediment on what was the highest hills. But we see crystalline rocks in Canada, Brazil, Sub-Saharan Africa, all these locations around the world. So it's not a surprise when you read the Bible and you look at how much sediment's in Canada, for example, you don't see a lot of sediment because there wasn't a lot of water to leave a lot of sediment. So if you have 23 feet of water, you can only put in about you know, five or 10 feet of sediment, maybe at the most. And then there was an ice age after the flood, and that's another story. But the ice age was, was a necessary ending to allow animals to get back in lower sea levels. But that ice age also destroyed a lot of these highest elevation sediments in the northern regions of the world. But in the Abserica and Zuni, we see a mixing of land and marine. You know, there's a line right here where everything below this is pretty much all marine, those first three sequences. And all of a sudden, we get land and marine, land and marine, land and marine. And this is the stuff that was stripped off, well, not the ice age per se, but a lot of these animals above the dinosaurs were the ones that are on the highest hills and they were stripped off the top. So as you went along, you buried different ecological zones. That's what gives us the fossil record. It's not common descent from a single ancestor, which is utter nonsense, as you just saw. You know, show me an experiment where you can make life. They've been trying for how many years now? And they can't. And so you can't make inorganic rocks and minerals turn into organic compounds. It's not that easy. So it's the order of burial gives us the order, but it's always mixed with marine throughout. That's very, very important because it fits the flood. It matches perfectly with what the Bible tells us. And God did say the water went down so we can live on the land now. And he says, in the wind, God made a wind to pass over the earth and the waters assuaged. It means they went back and forth, kind of like what tsunami waves do. You don't just get one tsunami wave, you get a multitude of them. So each sequence was basically a huge package of <laughs> Tsunami waves that came in and kind of backed off a little, and the next ones came in and backed off. Each time they got higher and higher and higher and peaked at about the end of the Cretaceous, the end of the Zuni. And then this happened. The fountains of the deep and the windows of heaven were stopped. 
So the plate stopped moving so dramatically, the rain from heaven was restrained. And the waters returned from off the earth continually. At the end of 150 days, the waters were abated. So again, God repeats 150 days of rising water. So if you were a human on the earth, you might not have died till day 148. 149, maybe even 150. It must have been horrific. That last month must have just been awful because it just kept coming higher and higher and higher. And you're trying to huddle around in the last little bit of land. There's a lot of regret. A lot of regret. But their fate was sealed. And today, you have the opportunity to ask Jesus into your heart if you haven't. So that you won't have the regret for eternity. You'll be cast into hell. Eternal torment. Forever and ever and ever. If you don't accept Jesus. But he's offered that free door, that opportunity. So here's the water going down. You see a lot of it shifts offshore. You see these really green colors are really thick areas. Like in the Gulf of Mexico where we look for a lot of oil down there. And even the oil itself is from marine algae buried in the flood. That becomes our source rock. So God provided coal through the burial of plants. He provided oil through the burial of marine algae all over the world in different layers uh, for us to use today. He knew we would need these energy resources today. And sure enough, there they are. We're using them to make our lives better. So here's the Tejas, again, mixing of land and marine, like we talked about before. So here, in conclusion to this section, anyway, I got a little more to go. You guys don't need lunch anyway. <laughs> right? You're, full, you're getting full of the spirit. That's a pastor say as they go on. Nah, 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 nah. Well, I'm not a pastor, so we'll end on it. We'll end, we'll end on time. All right, some pastors do. Conclusion, the global flood. Here's North America. Here you see the sequence. Here's these flood sequence. South America, see the same thing. Africa, peaks in the Zuni. Well, I think that's the global coverage is the best. Europe peaks a little bit earlier because Europe, I think, was more of a swampy area. Didn't have as much uplands. And so it flooded a little bit earlier. It's kind of small. So you add them all together, you get this pattern, which is why I drew my sea level curve to show. You know, minimal flooding, minimal flooding, minimal flooding, and then it peaks. This we start to get the animals in the purple. Land animals show up in purple, and coal seams show up in purple, and then you get more land animals and coal, and more land animals and coal, even offshore. And it's not a surprise you have so much volume in at the end, because that's just Asia. If we add them all up, we get this. This is the world's total, which looks very similar to Asia, except we see 36%. Of all the rocks deposited during the flood or all the receding phase. And they shouldn't be a surprise because so many mountains pop up at this same time. The Rockies, the Andes, 80% of the world's mountains, the Himalayas, all of them pop up at the same time at the end of the flood when the water's receding. And that has to do with plate tectonics as well. And the, the thicker crust pushes rocks up higher and mountains up higher and uh, things we don't need to get into. But that was causing a lot of erosion. Not only was it stripping off the land, but it was eroding off these mountains that are popping up like the Black Hills. You can see the core of these mountains because all the tops are stripped off them. And a lot of them was transported into the oceans as well. So here's kind of my summary chart of the flood. You can see day one down there starts in the sock and day 40 where the arc starts to float and then day 150 and we kind of, you know, I'm not 100% certain but it kind of works this way. The rain was upon the earth 40 days and 40 nights and that's those first three sequences where it's all marine fossils mostly. Now we know the ark is floating, so we know we're flooding land at this point, day 40. And you're working where the waters prevailed increasingly. That's days 40 to day 150. The waters prevailed exceedingly. The whole mountains were covered, day 150. And again, most of the mountains hadn't formed, mountains we think of as mountains, until after this, until this receding phase. They returned all through it continually. So here's kind of our summary. You stack these sequences on top of each other. Boom, boom, boom. You see very little flooding early, and then all of a sudden there's a lot more, because now you're flooding the land and even more, and you get the receding phase. And this is what you see. This is the world's rocks all the way up. And you see there's still areas that kind of that blue, you know, same color as this. There, there are no rocks today because these areas were the highest hills, and they only had 23 feet of water zipping across them. It didn't leave a lot of sediments behind. But you can see that again. That's pretty amazing. So there was a global flood. There's evidence out there. It's undeniable evidence of a global flood. It was also catastrophic. We see bones and fossils. We see mixing animals eating each other. We see land plants mixed with, you know, fishy, swimming animals. We see dinosaurs and fish. We see fish eating fish, the last meals eating fish. They're not gagging and choking on these like some evolutionists have suggested. They really have. 
these things were, they were buried instantly to preserve them. You only make a fossil by burying things rapid and deep. Fossils aren't forming today hardly anywhere, except for major landslides possibly. But those are going to be just little tiny little specks. The global fossil record comes from the global flood. And we see flat and stacked coal beds like this. There's no evidence that this was a swamp because we don't see any roots anywhere. There's no trees, roots in the bottom down here. Where all the, if this was a swamp that built up over millions of years, and then there's another swamp, and many of these rocks around it are limestone, which are marine rocks. So obviously you're mixing marine and land, even in the rock layers. But they're perfectly flat. Everywhere we look at coal seams, perfect flat tops and bottoms. Just piles of vegetation buried and squished in the flood. And there's few erosional surfaces. This is the Coconino Sandstone in Grand Canyon on top of a very soft hermit shale. It's supposed to be about a million years of erosion there, and look at this line. Everywhere you look in Grand Canyon, it's the same. Where are the canyons? Where are the roof and you know, gullies and valleys that should have been carved in a million years' time on this surface? If you're an old earther, where are they? And it gets even worse. Here in Grand Canyon is red wall limestone, big, huge, thick limestone. Here's the Muav limestone. It's supposed to be 160 million years on this line right here. I'll go back. Do you see how flat everything is? Flat on flat. 160 million years of time, there was no uplift, no folding, no nothing. That's what we see all over the world, all over the country, in fact. Extensive stacked layers are everywhere. We can see them better in Grand Canyon, but as you drill these wells and these columns I look at, you see that everywhere. They go all the way from here to Michigan. Here's the red wall limestone in blue down here in Grand Canyon. Well, it's the same limestone all the way up the Rockies, all the way over to my home state of Michigan, all the way down here in Texas. You can drill a well here, hit the same limestone that you can see in Grand Canyon right here in Texas. That blue is across the whole country. We can go back and see where all these caves are. But it, here's the same sandstone, the Tapete sandstone, the bottom layers in Grand Canyon in yellow goes across the entire country. So it starts here in Grand Canyon. You see it everywhere, all the way to Michigan, my home state, all the way up the Rockies, down here in Texas. You can drill a well, and they have. That's why we know it goes this far. So it isn't just what you can see in Grand Canyon. These layers go across the entire United States. What could deposit these layers that oftentimes are only as thick as this room? What could deposit these in one big swath other than a global flood? What's the best explanation? It's not slowly millions of years of rivers moving their way across, because you wouldn't get the same exact sandstone everywhere you look. You wouldn't get the same limestone everywhere you look. <coughs> you see stacked layers, even in Grand Canyon. There's no evidence of all this millions of years over here. You can use the same names, but the millions of years are just fabricated. But they need the millions of years because they need the millions of years to have evolution. If you don't have millions of years, you have no evolution. The rocks confirm layer upon layer upon layer. No evidence of time in between. There's no evidence of millions of years missing between these sequences. So the third thing is a recent flood. We're going to finish on this. I'm going to have to talk even faster because we've got a lot to go. So it's going to go quick. But, you know, what about those radiometric dates people often wonder about? I stole this from my colleague, Dr. Jake Hebert. I think that's him. That's a picture of him over there. Uh, but he's going to become a cartoon on our next planetarium show. Don't they prove the Earth is old? That's what people argue today. But these are facts. They teach them as facts when I went to geology classes. They teach them as facts when you watch movies. When you go to the Jurassic Park and Jurassic World movies, they teach you, they indoctrinate you with millions and millions of years. But let's test the rocks where we know how old the rocks are. And this is just some of them. We could go on and on and on on these, but I don't have time. Let's look at some rocks of known ages. And what uh, Steve Austin did when he worked for ISTAR is he went over to Mount St. Helens 10 years after it erupted, and he sampled some of the new lava dome and sent it to some labs. And they got estimates between 340,000 years old to 2.8 million years old for a rock that we saw form and crystallize and cool 10 years ago. So how accurate is that? This will be in a book. That's how old those rocks are. But we know it's 10 years old. Here's a few more examples. These are published in regular conventional geology journals. This isn't ICR. This is other people that did these. Old dates for rocks is the norm. So here's a bunch of basalts in Hawaii, Italy, Sicily, all these different places, all over the place. And you know the age of these lavas and rocks, and yet here's what they measured when they sampled them all. And they sent them off to the labs to age date these. This is the numbers. Do you see anything close to the right answer? Here's more, because you guys want more. Look at this. We know how old these are, and yet here's the numbers we get. 
So if you keep building a bridge as an engineer, and the bridge keeps collapsing, keep building a bridge, keeps collapsing, and the engineer says, oh, it's fine, drive over it. I know it's right. Would you? If these keep collapsing, well, they know the date of these, and then they test them, and they're not even close. They're many orders of magnitude off, as the mathematicians would tell you. A lot of zeros off. They're not even close. Almost every time that they've tested them, uh, known age rocks, they get the wrong answer. Way, way wrong answers. Yet they're telling you these are factual. We did this, and ICR did this. We tested their Cardenas basalt down here. You can see this in our Green Canyon exhibit. And then we tested this lava that came over the top. We know this is younger because the canyon was already there when that lava poured over the side. Lava falls, they call them. So this had to be buried earlier because you have all these rocks stacked on top. And then this erupted later, all during the flood probably. But here's what we did. This was 1.07 billion years. This is 1.34 billion years. How can this rock, which is an ice age, be older than the rock down here. I mean, it makes no sense. That's the kind of numbers you get when you send samples off. And they would just say, oh, this was bad sampling, or this was contaminated sample, or this whatever. If you don't get the number you want, they just explain it away until they get the right number they want. And they're like, OK, that's it. But then how do they verify that? There's no way to verify it besides another technique, which also gives you a different number usually. And so if isotope methods give incorrect age estimates of known rocks, you know, why are we supposed to trust them at all? But yet, they're taught to our kids, our grandkids, me, you, as fact. They're in all the movies as fact. And they can't go back and verify any of them. And the problem is this, too many assumptions. In essence, we have a two-dimensional understanding of a four-dimensional problem. And for you mathematicians in here, it's like two equations with four unknowns. If you're a math person, you know you have to have two equations and two unknowns. Four, equa four unknowns, you've got to have four equations. You know, for every one you don't know, you've got to have an equation. Well, they only have two equations, so what do they do? They make up two of the answers. They assume things that they can't assume, and then they, of course, and then it looks really good because there are two equations they use. They're like, oh, this is very scientific. But they have to assume the first two. And so that's the problem why every time they test, almost every time they test a rock of known age, they get numbers way off. They're way off the mark. This might be a Precise technique, but it's nowhere near accurate. I can shoot at a target all day long, and I'll be shooting off to the left. Get a really good cluster, but I'm not accurate. I might be precise because I'm hitting the same spot, but I'm not hitting the target. That's why Dr. G won't let me go shooting with him. Because <laughs> he's accurate and precise, whereas I'm just precise. Precisely inaccurate is what I am. <laughs> And that's what these rocks are. Anyway, and then Dr. Bryan talks about this a lot as well. Science is confirming a young age. We go to the rocks again. The rocks buried in the flood. We find soft things like that stretches like a rubber band. These are collagen, the soft tissue. The fossils are revealing proteins and blood vessels and blood cells and osteocytes, which are the bone-making cells, all the things that can't last more than thousands of years. Here's the example of a blood vessel. It's supposed to be 195 million years old. Here's osteocytes, the bone-making cells, and the little filia coming off the side. And these little black dots are red blood cells, presumably. <coughs> but you can see all this in the bones today. This is from way back in 2017. But they find these blood, they prove they have blood vessels. Here's a T-Rex blood vessel with a, probably a T-Rex red blood cell in it. You know, there's over 122 now, or at least 122 published scientific papers in the conventional journals. Over and over and over, they're finding more every year. So the bottom line is, there was a flood. It was catastrophic. It buried all these fossils. And the rocks we see, not only we can go back to those plates that are deep in the earth, they're still cold. That's clue number one, that the flood was recent. Because they're still cold all the way down to the mantle, all the way in through the mantle into the core. Secondly, we have all these blood vessels and cells and proteins. They can't survive millions of years. Yet we're finding them over and over and over over 122 now. And even oil. Oil is organic as well. Oil can't last millions of years. The oil company has told me we're drilling oil. It's 150 million years old in Wyoming. It's just sitting there waiting for us to drill. But you know darn well, you put gasoline out in your shed and leave it out there 20 years and try to put it in your lawnmower, how's it going to run? Not very well. Well, there's bacteria underground too. So most of the oil we do produce is heavily biodegraded, or at least partially biodegraded. 
and some of it's probably still forming today. Oil is not old either. Oil is another example of a creation moment when you can be put in your car today, you can grumble about the price. That's all politics, because there's a lot of oil. The reason I'm at ICR ultimately is because we were too good at our job. As geologists found too much oil, oil prices crash. Then they lay us off. That's why I got a PhD. I never would have got one. And then ICR wouldn't hire me without a PhD, so here I am. <laughs> and so ultimately, God had a plan. It was very, that was a quick summary of my career. But now I'm actually doing what God had trained me to do as an oil and gas geologist. He's already did enough of that. Got my PhD, already did enough of that. Now I need you at ICR. Yeah. So this is the greatest job I could ever have. I'm finally doing what God has called me to do. I finally figured out at age 52, 10 years ago, what God had planned for me. So some of you might not know what God's plan is, but he has one. Yeah. He's preparing you. You know, just like he prepared Moses. Moses was 80. I wasn't 80 anyway. Uh, but... <laughs> God has a plan. You just have to turn your life over to him. So here's the bottom line right here, the collapse of deep time and evolution. You pull away the deep time, and evolution collapses as well. That's why we're having a geology talk here, and not just biology. Because if we pull away this crazy concept of millions and billions of years, which has no basis, it has no basis in the rocks. The rocks could be deposited very, very quickly in the flood year that the Bible describes. If you pull that away, you have no chance of evolution to happen. Darwin needed this. As he said, it's a whole mindset. You start thinking deep time, you can do anything. But even with all the time they have in the world, it's still, we keep looking and looking, it seems to be, it's still impossible. That's why they can't create life in the laboratory. Only God can create life. So if you get a chance, I know it's lunchtime, mill around our bookstores back there, but a lot of my flood stuff is summarized in this carved in stone book. It was published in 2020. This covers three of the continents, but it shows the patterns that I see throughout the other continents I finished. And eventually there'll be a, a book that shows all the continents in the next couple of years, as long as you guys keep supporting ICR. And my boss decides to pay me after all. And then this came out, it won honorable mention from 2020 from World Magazine as a Readable science, so it's not too unreadable. And Dr. Gary Parker used to work at ICR, says the best thing. He says you point to one, two creator God throughout the book. Really, I, point, I want people to go to Jesus. Jesus is our creator. Jesus is our savior. He is the one that took our sins upon the cross. I mean, what God would do that? But our great, benevolent God. He loves us that much. Even while we were yet sinners, he died for us. And we're still sinners. All we have to offer to Jesus is our sin. But he's done it all. There's nothing more we can do besides believe. And if you only have $10 in your pocket, because it was free to get in here and you might have an extra $10, uh, this is the best book that summarizes a little bit of everything. And so if you don't have one of these, pick one up. And then if you don't have any money, you said it's free, it's free, it's free, this is free. You can sign up for Acts and Facts and get this every other month, plus a few special issues throughout the year as well. And so I think you'll get eight issues a year uh, now. And so it's free. But I know a lot of you are ICR fans and you've already signed up. But there might be one or two of you that haven't. So please sign up. It's free. So with that, I'm going to quit. I'm only four minutes over. woohoo! Because <laughs> I talk fast. And uh, because in the north, if you don't talk fast, your mouth freezes. <laughs> and so it's, I think that's why we talk fast. So on that note, it's, we'll bring Lauren in wherever she wants. We lost our MC. We lost our MC. Take it away, Miss Lauren. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. It's so encouraging, isn't it? It's not just one area that we see these evidences that confirm scripture. We saw it in bio biological life in Dr. Thomas's talk, and now we've heard about it in the geology sciences as well. Um, again, the Bible does stand up to scrutiny, and we're able to see that in very real ways, so hopefully that's been an encouragement. We now do have a lunch time. That's my personal favorite time of the day. And so we are going to go ahead and take a break until 1.15. It is currently 12.05. We're going to break till 1.15. There are multiple lunch options close by. I don't know if anyone brought your lunch. It's a little chilly outside, but there are some picnic tables out in our park. Also, there are lots of restaurants near ICR. The front desk does have a list that they can give you of some of the restaurants that are close by. 
Or if in doubt, just go on west up to, um, on Royal Lane, go west up to MacArthur. There's pretty much every kind of restaurant you can think of over there on MacArthur Boulevard. So feel free to check out that. This is also a great time to sign up for Acts and Facts magazine, our free magazine, either back there on the table or over by the front desk. And also just keep in mind, there are a lot of books being mentioned today. All of those books are available in our discovery store right out there. So if you're interested, if there's one that catches your attention, feel free to take a look at those. Um, our employees out there would be happy to point you in that direction. Or also, we have a lot of free resources available in our Acts and Facts magazine and on our website, icr.org. So feel free to check out that. Just a reminder, I'm going to give you the Q&A number just one more time. Um, you can continue to text questions that. We've already received a lot of really good questions, so thank you all for participating participating in that. Again, we won't be able to get to all of them, but we are looking at each question as it comes in. That number again is 833-626-2572. And we'd be happy to answer as many questions as we can get to during our Q&A session later this afternoon. All right, have a good lunch. We'll see you back here at 115. When did dinosaurs live? Where do they fit in the Bible? And how did they go extinct? If you have questions about dinosaurs, join us March 14th through 18th at the ICR Discovery Center for Dinosaur Week. Learn about these remarkable reptiles and the fascinating fossils they left behind from ICR's experts and special guest, David Mickelson of Everything Fossil. Experience interactive, hands-on fossil preparation and casting workshops. Unearth dinosaur bones at our fossil dig tables, enjoy our fossil petting zoo, and marvel at our full-size dinosaur fossil exhibit. Visit icr.org slash events to plan your visit.
When did dinosaurs live? Where do they fit in the Bible? And how did they go extinct? If you have questions about dinosaurs, join us March 14th through 18th at the ICR Discovery Center for Dinosaur Week. Learn about these remarkable reptiles and the fascinating fossils they left behind from ICR's experts and special guest David Mickelson of Everything Fossil. Experience interactive, hands-on fossil preparation and casting workshops. Unearth dinosaur bones at our fossil dig tables, enjoy our fossil petting zoo, and marvel at our full-size dinosaur fossil exhibit. Visit icr.org slash events to plan your visit.
When did dinosaurs live? Where do they fit in the Bible? And how did they go extinct? If you have questions about dinosaurs, join us March 14th through 18th at the ICR Discovery Center for Dinosaur Week. Learn about these remarkable reptiles and the fascinating fossils they left behind from ICR's experts and special guest David Mickelson of Everything Fossil. Experience interactive, hands-on fossil preparation and casting workshops, unearth dinosaur bones at our fossil dig tables, enjoy our fossil petting zoo, and marvel at our full-size dinosaur fossil exhibit. Visit icr.org slash events to plan your visit.
When did dinosaurs live? Where do they fit in the Bible? And how did they go extinct? If you have questions about dinosaurs, join us March 14th through 18th at the ICR Discovery Center for Dinosaur Week. Learn about these remarkable reptiles and the fascinating fossils they left behind from ICR's experts and special guest David Mickelson of Everything Fossil. Experience interactive, hands-on fossil preparation and casting workshops. Unearth dinosaur bones at our fossil dig tables, enjoy our fossil petting zoo, and marvel at our full-size dinosaur fossil exhibit. Visit icr.org events to plan your visit.
When did dinosaurs live? Where do they fit in the Bible? And how did they go extinct? If you have questions about dinosaurs, join us March 14th through 18th at the ICR Discovery Center for Dinosaur Week. Learn about these remarkable reptiles and the fascinating fossils they left behind from ICR's expert and special guest, David Mickelson of Everything Fossil. Experience interactive, hands-on fossil preparation and casting workshops. Unearth dinosaur bones at our fossil dig tables, enjoy our fossil petting zoo, and marvel at our full-size dinosaur fossil exhibit. Visit icr.org slash events to plan your visit.
When did dinosaurs live? Where do they fit in the Bible? And how did they go extinct? If you have questions about dinosaurs, join us March 14th through 18th at the ICR Discovery Center for Dinosaur Week. Learn about these remarkable reptiles and the fascinating fossils they left behind from ICR's experts and special guest David Mickelson of Everything Fossil. Experience interactive, hands-on fossil preparation and casting workshops. Unearth dinosaur bones at our fossil dig tables, enjoy our fossil petting zoo, and marvel at our full-size dinosaur fossil exhibit. Visit icr.org slash events to plan your visit.
When did dinosaurs live? Where do they fit in the Bible? And how did they go extinct? If you have questions about dinosaurs, join us March 14th through 18th at the ICR Discovery Center for Dinosaur Week. Learn about these remarkable reptiles and the fascinating fossils they left behind from ICR's experts and special guest, David Mickelson of Everything Fossil. Experience interactive, hands-on fossil preparation and casting workshops. Unearth dinosaur bones at our fossil dig tables, enjoy our fossil petting zoo, and marvel at our full-size dinosaur fossil exhibit. Visit icr.org slash events to plan your visit.
When did dinosaurs live? Where do they fit in the Bible? And how did they go extinct? If you have questions about dinosaurs, join us March 14th through 18th at the ICR Discovery Center for Dinosaur Week. Learn about these remarkable reptiles and the fascinating fossils they left behind from ICR's experts and special guest David Mickelson of Everything Fossil. Experience interactive, hands-on fossil preparation and casting workshops. Unearth dinosaur bones at our fossil dig tables, enjoy our fossil petting zoo, and marvel at our full-size dinosaur fossil exhibit. Visit icr.org slash events to plan your visit.
When did dinosaurs live? Where do they fit in the Bible? And how did they go extinct? If you have questions about dinosaurs, join us March 14th through 18th at the ICR Discovery Center for Dinosaur Week. Learn about these remarkable reptiles and the fascinating fossils they left behind from ICR's experts and special guest David Mickelson of Everything Fossil. Experience interactive, hands-on fossil preparation and casting workshops, unearth dinosaur bones at our fossil dig tables, enjoy our fossil petting zoo, and marvel at our full-size dinosaur fossil exhibit. Visit icr.org slash events to plan your visit.
When did dinosaurs live? Where do they fit in the Bible? And how did they go extinct? If you have questions about dinosaurs, join us March 14th through 18th at the ICR Discovery Center for Dinosaur Week. Learn about these remarkable reptiles and the fascinating fossils they left behind from ICR's expert and special guest, David Mickelson of Everything Fossil. Experience interactive, hands-on fossil preparation and casting workshops. Unearth dinosaur bones at our fossil dig tables, enjoy our fossil petting zoo, and marvel at our full-size dinosaur fossil exhibit. Visit icr.org slash events to plan your visit.
When did dinosaurs live? Where do they fit in the Bible? And how did they go extinct? If you have questions about dinosaurs, join us March 14th through 18th at the ICR Discovery Center for Dinosaur Week. Learn about these remarkable reptiles and the fascinating fossils they left behind from ICR's experts and special guest, David Mickelson of Everything Fossil. Experience interactive, hands-on fossil preparation and casting workshops. Unearth dinosaur bones at our fossil dig tables, enjoy our fossil petting zoo, and marvel at our full-size dinosaur fossil exhibit. Visit icr.org slash events to plan your visit.
When did dinosaurs live? Where do they fit in the Bible? And how did they go extinct? If you have questions about dinosaurs, join us March 14th through 18th at the ICR Discovery Center for Dinosaur Week. Learn about these remarkable reptiles and the fascinating fossils they left behind from ICR's experts and special guest David Mickelson of Everything Fossil. Experience interactive, hands-on fossil preparation and casting workshops. Unearth dinosaur bones at our fossil dig tables. Enjoy. Hi, I'm Randy Galuza, president of the Institute for Creation Research. It's hard to believe that ICR has completed over 50 years of scientific research. As you know, we bring the confidence-building truth that Christians can believe the Bible starting with, in the beginning, God created. It certainly doesn't seem like it's been five decades of research. The excitement that I felt when reading Acts and Facts for the first time lit a fire for creation science within me that, to this day, has not diminished. I remember how the message from ICR was like a cup of cold water in one hand and a map home in the other at a time when I was lost in a scientific and spiritual wasteland. As the saying goes, I shudder to think where I would be today without the intervention of ICR. Now, as president, I'm privileged to read so many messages from Christians with the same story. A lot of them are from you, our friends, who have been partnering with us on this campaign to show that science confirms the accuracy of God's Word. We are creation scientists, and together with our valuable staff, we are honored to be included with the Bible-believing scientists of the past. Some founded important scientific disciplines, all while staying faithful to their church. ICR exists to support the local church. One of our primary jobs is to help pastors lead, feed, and defend their flock. How? Well, we do the scientific research to provide Christians with answers to the challenges coming from a huge crowd of secular scientists and skeptics. Along those lines, ICR has renewed our effort for rigorous scientific research. Today, we sense that our most pressing assignment from the Lord Jesus is to fundamentally change the way people understand biology. Our task is to put together a completely new theory of biological design, one that unites recent scientific discoveries and respects the biblical narrative. The theory would explain the innumerable, fascinating examples of creatures' abilities will accentuate their highly engineered internal systems. By doing this, we'll give glory to their Creator, the Lord Jesus, and not to nature. We understand that approaching biology from an engineering perspective may be so new to many of you, but it's long overdue. Can you think of any part of a creature that wasn't engineered? We anticipate that engineering-based models for any biological function, like adaptation, will become standard explanations in Christian textbooks and museums. These will be vital as we educate young believers for many generations. We also pray that an engineering-based approach to biology will once again stir up a sense of certainty in Christian truth. Recall that I said that ICR's most pressing assignment is to change how people understand biology. But that is not our only assignment. We are not scaling anything back in the physical sciences. Our research in geology, the Ice Age, and the like will continue with as much vigor as ever. Our name and purpose haven't changed. We're still the ICR that you know, love, and support. Our foundation endures as solid as when it was laid by Drs. Henry M. Morris and Duane Gish. So, whether you've just heard about our ministry or have partnered with us from the beginning, ICR remains your trustworthy resource for cutting-edge science that confirms the Bible and equips Christians to defend our faith. Without a doubt, we are excited to increase our impact by revealing the incredible, literally mind-blowing wonders of divine engineering within the realm of biology. There is so much out there that will leave you astounded. All of us, as followers of Christ, 
and as creationists, continue to have a big part to play in this. Countless numbers of our friends over many years have had their hands in advancing some piece of ICR's ministry. So, if you volunteer at our events, give to us, or pray for ICR, I want to say on behalf of our wonderful staff, thank you very much. As you can tell, we are very excited about this new era in the life of ICR. But please know that through everything we communicate, we will always seek to consistently exalt the Lord Jesus as our Creator, our Savior, and our returning King. All right. Did everybody have a good lunch? Good. Well, welcome back to ICR's Darwin Dethroned Seminar. 
Now, hopefully y'all were able to subscribe to Acts and Facts and also on YouTube. Okay, with YouTube, I know I've mentioned a couple times, but I have to admit I'm a little bit biased. So my name is Lauren Pennington and I've worked at ICR for several years now um, under different different um, jobs, different titles and responsibilities. Right now I'm serving in our digital media department. So it's a pleasure to be here today. And that's why I am so eager for you to go and subscribe on YouTube. It's not just a matter of subscribing. It's a matter of being able to know when we release new content. Um, we have several different podcasts, the Creation Podcast, Creation.Live. They are so encouraging and tackle different topics, sometimes even presented by our viewers, that really have to do with faith and science and how the two intermingle. And sometimes, like with Creation.Live, sometimes it's issues in society that people are wondering about. So hopefully you can go on and subscribe to that. We would love to have you on there. Now it is time for me to present our next speaker. ICR president, Dr. Randy Galuza, has his Bachelor of Science in Engineering from the South Dakota School of Mines and Technology. He also has a Bachelor of Arts in Theology from Moody Bible Institute, an MD from the University of Minnesota, and a Master of Public Health from Harvard University. He served nine years in the Navy Civil Engineer Corps and is a registered professional engineer. In 2008, he retired as a lieutenant colonel from the Air Force, where he served as the 28th Bomb Wing Flight Surgeon and Chief of Aerospace Medicine, and at that point, he joined ICR as a national representative. He was appointed president of ICR back in 2020, and we've been so blessed by that. He's also the author of Made in His Image, Clearly Seen, Five Minutes with a Darwinist, and 20 Evolutionary Blunders. He also contributed to Guide to Creation Basics, Creation Basics and Beyond, and the Made in His Image DVD series. Dr. Galuza's number one passion in life and ministry is to glorify Jesus Christ as the creator of all, the sustainer of all, and the savior of everyone who believes in him. Please welcome with me ICR President Dr. Randy Galuza. Wow. Thank you for coming back after lunch and hanging out here for another hour. All of those things, all those books that I did are really going to pale in significance in many, many ways to the things that we're working on right now. And we're going to be talking today, Lord willing, about, we have to put the slides up on the screen here, who's over in the back on that. There we go. And the microphone isn't on either. Okay, it says it's on, on, on. There we go, there we go. Thank you. So it's really important what we're gonna be talking about today in terms of replacing Darwin's sacred imposter. And in fact, what we're going to be really discussing in terms of all of these things are, man, I went back to this, is mutation selection, our self-destructive compromise. And if I were to ask you, and I'm not even taking a raise of hands here, how many of you believe that uh, evolutionary thinking tends towards atheism? I bet you I would get the vast majority of your hands there. But if I were to ask you, go out to a friend and talk to a friend and explain to them, tell them how does evolutionary thinking tend towards atheism? And go through the details of how it takes a person who, who might believe in God and take them over to atheistic thinking, you would probably struggle with that. So, all Christians, all Christians can take their witness of Christ as the creator and savior to the next level by learning three enlightening truths. Three enlightening truths for all of us. The first is this, the Christian, the creatures and human designed things share corresponding engineered features or engineered parts. This is something new and we haven't been really teaching this for a very long time, but it's absolutely essential that we learn this. Second, that believing in adaptation, and I'm sp speaking specifically today about adaptation, by random mutations and natural selection is anti-theistic because it is anti-design. And number three, the mutation selection explanation harms both science and theology. So these are the main topics that we're gonna be covering today. And I think if we get these down, then we'll be able to enhance our witness with others around us. So first, creatures and human design things share corresponding engineered features. And this is what we have to explain. 
You look at that newborn baby and all creatures just like that have features enabling it to grow, metabolize, reproduce, and adapt. All living things do this. And as Dr. Thomas was talking about this morning, in order for something to be alive, it actually has to do all of these functions. And so it's very difficult for chemistry to become biology because you have to explain every one of these complicated functions within a creature. So looking right off at the very beginning, let's look at several biblical indicators of how creatures operate. And so this is very new. We're going to go right to the Bible and see if it's going to give us any clues about creatures. And right here in Psalm 19.1, it's one that we have memorized, but we only say the first part of the verse very often. The heavens declare the glory of God. But the second part is very important because it says the firmament declares his handiwork. And it's pointing out that God is doing some kind of handiwork. And then in Psalm 8, it says the cosmos is the work of your fingers and humans are made to have dominion over the work of your hands. And then of course in Psalm 9 verse 5 it says it speaks of the Lord's sovereignty over the creation that his hands have formed. Psalm 102 verse 25 says that God laid the foundations of the earth and the heavens are the work of your hands. Psalm 143, David said, I meditate on your works and I muse, or that is ponder, the work of your hands. And of course, in Romans chapter 1, verse 20, Paul says, invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen being understood by the things that are made. And that Greek word for made there is used only one other time in the New Testament in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10, where it says we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus. So we have a theme here coming over and over again in the Bible. It says that creation is the work of his hands. It shows handiwork. It shows some type of workmanship. And so this should lead us to ask the question because of all this repetition. What if this is just not figurative language? What if this isn't figurative language? What if the Lord is giving us a clue of how living creatures are expected to operate? Maybe there's a clue here. Maybe we should be looking at creatures as a form of workmanship. Maybe we should be changing our research methods as all creationists. Maybe we should be setting up our experiments in such a way that we can identify features of workmanship in anticipation that we will find it inside of these creatures there. And then on top of that, when the Lord says that creatures are handiwork and he says that they are workmanship, my question to you would be this. How do you even know what workmanship and handiwork is? The only way you know what handiwork is is by comparing it to human engineered things. This is telling you what workmanship is, and if we can identify features in a human-engineered thing, maybe we can find those same features in God-engineered things. Maybe we've been way off base for such a long time, we should be looking for features of workmanship. And if you look at the picture on the screen with this prosthetic device, the mere fact that it can connect to a human indicates that they both are sharing some engineering features that allow them to do that. Now that prosthetic device is quite incredible, but the arm that that's going to be connected, de connected to is even more incredible. And so point number one, maybe we should be looking for features of workmanship. And how do we know what workmanship is? It is always the words. This is teaching point number one. It's always the words which characterize something, which describe it, which tell us what workmanship is. And in addition to that, these words also give an indication about their origins. So if we were to play a game show and we were to have this side of the room against that side of the room, and I would ask you, what are the top characteristics of design? What kind of words would you use to characterize design? Well, here's one, purposeful. Designs are purposeful. Here's another, regulated. Engineered things are regulated. Here's another characteristic. They're generally very, very complex. On top of that, they usually have results that are highly targeted to very specific solutions. They're orderly. They're specified. They have, they have features which are fitting and suitable 
for their environment as if they were planned to be there. And on top of that, they're very, very precise and they're very, very accurate. So all of these words, all of these characteristics are important because when you hear those words in your brain, you are thinking what? Engineered and design. Everything is hinging on the characteristics that we give to these words. So when you look at that engine off to the side, and if I were to give you many of, a lot of time to think about it, I would say, write down the characteristics of design that you see. You would write, well, I see numerous interconnected parts. I see a particular arrangement. I see proper alignment. I see moving parts, precise timing. I see exact dimensions and shape. And these characteristics that you see in the engine are what are telling you that it is designed. Now, I am foot stomping this because characteristics are extremely important in conveying ideas about origins. The characteristics convey the ideas about origins. And so when I look at living creatures, and Dr. Thomas covered some of them, the ATPA synthase this morning and stuff, I see DNA maintenance robots that proofread information. They unwind double helixes. They cut and they splice and they rewind and they put things together. I see molecular machines which are doing these things. I see intracellular elevators inside of those creatures. I see mobile brace builders inside of cells that construct tubular just like you would see a human engineer would do. In addition to that, when these cells and other features inside of them are put together, I see other molecules within the cell which act like templates, workbenches, clamps, and vices. And even when I look at the little cellular machines themselves down at the super, super microscopic level, I see things inside a cell that act like switches, batteries, motors, brakes, shafts, rods, bearings, bushings, and on and on. I see all of these things operating in the exact same way for the exact same purposes as a human engineered thing. Now, if you, if you could believe that most people, if they could see this, they would probably conclude that these things are engineered. And on top of that, when I look inside of a little plant hopper, his rear legs are connected together by a super microscopic set of gears that correspond in function to human engineered gears. So am I seeing features of workmanship? When the Bible says it is the work of his hands, it says that it is handiwork, are we seeing evidences of handiwork? The answer is yes. So teaching point number two, and this is really important and this should change the way you talk with your friends. It's not that just living things are complicated or complex. It's the fact that human, the engineered workmanship that we see in living creatures that corresponds to, this is really important, it corresponds to the human engineered workmanship that we see in man-made things. That correspondence is the primary and undeniable revelation of Christ's power, genius, and wisdom. So the next time you're talking with friends, you point out that living things have parts that work in the same way for the same purposes as man-made things. And that is a really powerful testimony. And that is why even this atheist, Richard Dawkins says, in his book explaining why atheism is right, he points out that we are entirely accustomed to the idea that complex elegance is an indicator of premeditated crafted design. And this is probably the most powerful reason for the belief held by the vast majority of people that have ever lived in some kind of supernatural deity. Because whether people can actually describe it or not intuitively, they see this correspondence between God-made things and man-made things, and they conclude that these things were engineered, and therefore they conclude that there is a God. So in terms of origins, if we have an explanation that is design-based, it is a theistic explanation. In fact, you can say the theism that we see is evidenced by the design that we see in creatures.
So design-based explanations are theistic explanations. Point number one, improve your witness with your friends by pointing out this correspondence, and we as creationists can take our game to the next level by designing our research and our experiments to look for Christ's handiwork. Point number two, and this is really the guts of this talk, believing that adaptation, and this is important, happens by random mutations and natural selection is inherently anti-theistic because it is inherently and cannot be changed from something that is anti-design. So if it is anti-design in nature, it will be anti-theistic. And that is because when evolutionists see that little baby there, they don't see a completed work. In fact, they don't see any creature as a completed work. They see every feature on every creature as a work in progress. It's not completed. And they see it as a work in progress by the tiny little cumulative adaptations that add up over a long period of time. So it is this accumulation of adaptations which explains how organisms grow, metabolize, reproduce, and adapt. They have a completely different view towards these creatures that we do. And this man right here, Peter Godfrey Smith, he recognizes this. And so he points out the, that there are some big questions in biology, and this is what they need to answer. The apparent design, he says, of organisms and the relations of adaptation, of adaptedness between organisms and their environment are the big questions, and that's his emphasis, the amazing facts of biology. Explaining this phenomenon or these phenomena the core intellectual mission is the core intellectual mission of evolutionary theory. Natural selection is the key to solving these problems. Selection is the big answer. So this is what biology has been about, explaining the apparent design and why organisms fit so well with their environment. And this was the purpose of Darwin's theory. Darwin's theory was not to explain the origin of life. Darwin's theory was not to explain the diversity of life. Darwin's theory was to, was to explain why living creatures look so incredibly designed without reference to a designer. And so he developed a way of interpreting biological phenomena. He developed a way of looking at adaptation and framing what he saw so that what he saw would be interpreted in terms of anti-design. And that is why theory is so important, because theory influences what we see and how we interpret it. And then those interpretations reinforce our theory. Now, how do I know that this is true? Because the former president of the American, the Academy for the American Advancement of Sciences, Francis Ayala, publishing in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, pointed out that Darwin's greatest discovery was design without a designer. And right from the abstract, he says this, with Darwin's discovery of natural selection, the origin and adaptations of organisms was brought into the realm of science. The adaptive features of organisms can now be explained like the phenomena of the inanimate world as the result of natural processes without recourse to an intelligent designer. Now you would be wondering why would a science journal, one of the leading science journals of the United States, even be publishing such an article? Because evolutionary theory has an agenda. And the agenda is to advance their naturalistic view of the world. He goes on to say this, Darwin's theory of natural selection accounts for the design of organisms. So he's answering one of the big questions. Why do organisms look designed without a designer? And, their, and for their wondrous diversity as the result of natural processes, and this is what it is. If you are taking notes, this is so important. The accumulation, he doesn't just say the accumulation, the gradual accumulation of spontaneous arisen variations, genetic mistakes, those mutations, that are sorted out by evolution. That is the gist of their theory. Random processes which somehow get acted on in a mysterious way where nature can sort them 
out. Now, if you're a thoughtful reader, some red flags should be going up in your mind. Random, broken things? Nature acting as if it can think in order to sort stuff out? He goes on to say this, this was Darwin's fundamental discovery that there is a process that is creative, although not conscious. Thoughtful reader again. Bing, 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 bing. This should be going off in your mind. Have you ever, ever in your life ever seen a creative process that was not conscious? You know, we read over this stuff so quickly and you hear it in Nova and you hear it on National Geographic. You should question everything. This makes no sense. And so he is taking people from what they intuitively know and their own common sense is telling them that when you see something like this, it was put together and he's trying to get you to believe it was put together by a natural unconscious process that can act as if it had a brain to sort broken things out. That's the gist of it. And that is why this is really, really a very foolish thinking, but it leads people to incredible, incredible changes in their worldview. You've heard of this man, Bertram Russell. He was a famous philosopher, English philosopher. He said way back in 1903, he summarized the implications of Darwinian thinking. He says, but even more purposeless, more purposeless. Now, where's he getting purposelessness? From broken mutations. More void of meaning is the world which science presents for our belief, and he means evolutionary science, that man is the product of causes which had no prevision of the end they were achieving. It was blind, it was unconscious that his origin, his growth, his hopes and fears, his loves and beliefs are all but the outcome of accidental collocations of atoms, adding, quote, that nature, omnipotent but blind, and the revolutions of her secular hurryings through the abysses of space has brought forth mankind with the capacity of judging all the works of his unthinking mother. Is this a worldview? It is a worldview. It's a worldview in which he sees Mother Nature bringing forth human beings in a completely random, chaotic, unthinking process. Now, how does he get to be thinking like that? How does evolutionary thinking tend towards people which initially see creatures, and as Dawkins said, the vast majority of them believe they were created, to where you get people thinking that they are products of a completely random, chaotic process. What are the nuts and bolts that Darwin put into his theory which can change people's thinking in such a radical, counterintuitive way? How does he do it? How do they do it? Well, we need to cover evolutionary theory. So this is the hardest part of the lecture. I need you to look at four basic quotes where people are telling us what the basic tenets of evolutionary theory are. These are all four different sources. It says the random occurrence of mutations. Oh, oh, please look for repetitive words. Repetitive words giving you a, a repetitive theme as we cover the basics of evolutionary theory. Here's a foot stomper, the random, boom, boom, boom. The random occurrence of mutations with respect to their consequences is an axiom upon what, which much of biology and evolutionary theory rests. This simple proposition has had profound effects on models of evolution developed since the modern synthesis, shaping how biologists have thought about and studied genetic diversity over the past century. Basic number two, the core tenet of the modern synthesis, that is modern evolutionary theory, is that adaptive evolution due to natural selection acting on heritable variability that originates through accidental changes in the genetic material. Such mutations are random in the sense that they arise without reference to their advantages and disadvantages. Number three, evolutionary theory asserts 
Evolutionary theory. You've probably never really studied evolutionary theory, what theory really is. These people are telling us. Evolutionary theory asserts that adaptive mutations which improve cellular fitness in challenging environments occur at random and cannot be controlled by the cell. Now stop. What, what words are coming up over and over again here? Random, accidental, and all of this thing. And they say evolutionary theory asserts that these things are random. Is evolutionary theory asserting this based on observation of real things in nature, or is it asserting it based on its presuppositional views of life? Presuppositional views of life. These assertions, these assumptions are not reflecting what they have discovered. They are reflecting what they already believe. Is that important? You better believe it's important. So that it asserts these things. The assertion that adaptation occurs purely through natural selection of random mutations is deeply embedded in our understanding of evolution. And finally, number four, a classical or Darwinian evolutionary system. So I'm not giving you trite things. I'm giving you quotes from people who are telling you this is the basics of evolutionary theory. Embodies a basic principle. Purposeless genetic variation of reproductive individuals united by common descent coupled with natural selection of those rare individuals that fortuitously express the traits. It's a process replete with chance. So what thing is coming up over and over again? Purposelessness, chance, accidental, all of those things. Now this is really important because we go back to point number one. Words are important and the characteristics that you give to what you are seeing is really important. How you characterize it is really important because these words convey your ideas of their origins. And so I can't footstop how important it is that the characterizations that evolutionists give to things are vital to their convincing people that they are the product, not of God, but of a random chaotic process. And it is these characteriz characterizations which have been the workhorse of evolutionary theory from the beginning because they set a narrative for decades. So when evolutionists were studying creatures and they saw certain organs that they didn't know what their function was, they characterized those organs as what? Vestigial. Now is vestigial carrying thoughts of how they think the organ originated? You better believe it is. When they saw DNA that they didn't immediately know the function was, they characterized it as what? Junk. When they characterize it as junk, is it doing work for evolutionary theory? You better believe it is. It is telling you something about how they think it originated. And when they look at certain creatures, <laughs> which are still alive today, and they classify certain features as primitive features and other creatures as having advanced features, are they telling us what they think about those creatures? You better believe it. So we have been missing this. Their characterizations are what are conveying in people's minds what they think the origins are. Do you think these words have been persuasive to people over the decades? Vestigial, junk, primitive? You better believe they're persuasive to people, especially when they're published in the best scientific papers. But remarkably, there wasn't any compelling scientific evidence that organisms, organs were vestigial or the DNA really was junk. Long before you even knew it, they characterized it this way as a propaganda device to get people believing their theory. And this is really important. This is really important. So the words that are characterizing an object as random or a random product, you know what they're also doing? They're conveying evolutionary ideas about their origins at the same time. So let's go back. We're back to the game show. 
Instead of now looking for the top eight characteristics of design, we're looking for the top eight characteristics of anti-design. Anti-design, in all eight of these words, I picked out of scientific literature that I had to find at least four times. Four times. Now, did I say storybooks? I said I found it in what? Scientific literature. Number one, purposeless. Number two, random. We can find that out hundreds of times. Three, accidental. Four, trial and error, or another word is hit and miss. Broken, unplanned, cobbled together, and messy. Do you think when people hear that they are a product of these kinds of processes that they start to think differently about their origins? You better believe they do. And so therefore you have this word random mutations, random mutations, which is repeated ad nauseum, ad nauseum in scientific literature, almost as a mantra, mutations occur at random, even though they don't know that, and they are consistently describing creatures with all of these characteristics they're sending a message. In addition to that, they say they're sorted out by natural selection. And because of this, they have an unconscious creative force. Broken things sorted by natural selection equals an unconscious creative force, which leads people to a very counterintuitive, but a very strong anti-design view that organisms came about via a chaotic and purposeless process. What I am doing is I am trying to take you through the fact that you know that evolutionary thinking tends towards atheism and explain to you how it gets people to see it and think it themselves. So that when this woman hears this over and over again, that process is drilled into her mind and she is told in scientific literature, it's true these are broken things, it's true these are random, it's true that this is a trial and error process. And she is told that natural sele selection can act like a real human breeder. When she's told that is true, and she is, it's reinforced in the best scientific forums, guess what she begins to think? Wow, that sounds an awful lot like Darwinian evolution. And it doesn't sound like a direct creation by God. Bingo. You've just taken people from seeing something that has all the features of design, and because you've got them to believe that a random chaotic process could produce it, you've got them to believe that this is more consistent with evolution, and it certainly doesn't fit God making these creatures. You know why? Because no rational thinking engineer would use broken things, accidental things, random things, they would never do it. And if no rational human engineer would do this, why would God do it? Does that make sense? And that's how they get people across that. And it is this constant drumbeat, broken, random, accidental, blah, 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 that gets people thinking these things. Wow. So this is how you get the first part. You have this materialistic worldview which doesn't believe that there's a creator, which as we read four detailed explanations of their theory, they have the assumptions that when they see a genetic change, it's something that is broken. They assume that it is random. They assume that it's a loss of function. They assume all of these things. And because they assume that, when they see them, they characterize them with these descriptors, these anti design descriptors. And all of those descriptors can be summed up in one word, mutation. Mutation. Mutation in the average mind indicates what? Accidental, broken, blah, 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 blah. And this right there is your anti-design element of the mutation selection mechanism.
Hmm. How can you ever make that design-oriented, broken, accidental, blah, 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 blah? How are you ever going to make that fit what a real engineer would do? This, this is inherently anti-design. And you know what? Every time you and I in this room have ever said the mutation selection mechanism is true but limited, you know what we just did? We just placed ourselves right here. We just placed ourselves in this anti-design realm playing Darwin's game on Darwin's field by Darwin's rules. And you can never win. You can't win. So we need to abandon this whole idea about mutation and we need to have some second thoughts about the mutation selection thing. So, in terms of origin of creatures, anti-design is anti-theistic by nature and you can never change it. You know why? Because our creator reveals himself by the evidences he gives in design. That's why. That's why he does it. So Darwin's anti-designer view approach to interpreting how organisms act, it reverses the engineering reality of purpose-driven targeted solutions to hit and miss outcomes. That was what we just discussed. It inverts the cause of organism change from the organism itself to the environment, and it personifies nature as exercising pervasive agency that supplants an organism's agency and substitutes itself as the designing agency. Let's look at those next two. Darwin devised an anti-design explanation by becoming the first one to look at organisms, not in terms of what they do themselves, but what the environment does to them. Stephen Jay Gould, probably the world's leading evolutionary theorist, in his book, The Structure of Evolutionary Theory, points out Darwin's theory in strong and revolutionary contrast presents the first externalist account of evolution. Darwin overturned all previous traditions by granting the external environment a causal and controlling role in the direction of evolutionary change. Now what does he mean by that? Gould's colleague Richard Lawton explains, for Darwin the external world, the environment acting on organisms was the cause of the form of organism. The environment, the external world with its autonomous properties was the subject and the organism was again the object acted upon. You know why he's flipping it around? Because organisms which seem to be able to adjust themselves and adapt themselves sound like they're really, really designed. But if organisms are passive modeling clay which are shaped by their environment, then you can end up getting people to think in terms of this random change. Lewontin goes on to say this, it is, it is from this view of the environment as the cause of organism. It's the cause of organism because it gives life. It's the cause of organism because it gives the diversity of life. That the entire corpus of modern biology arises. We cannot fully appreciate the nature of the change in biology wrought by Mendel through genetics and Darwin through this externalism unless we understand the historical importance of the objectification of the organism. The organism is just an object that is acted on. Two other evolutionists gave even more details. He, that is Darwin, accepted the view that the environment directly instructs the organism how to vary, and he proposed a mechanism for inheriting those changes. The organism was like modeling clay, and the remolding of the clay meant each of the billions of little grains was free to move a little bit in any direction and generate form. Do you see what it's saying? If, if the environment changes and the organism changes, it's not because the organism changed itself, it's because the environment shaped the organism. Organisms become passive. They're molded by the environment. And this greatly changes the view of the power of organisms. In addition to this, Darwin added an upward trajectory. He says because organisms are constantly competing for scarce resources, then there's always a better creature which beats out the weaker creature, which leads to a direction and change. He added Malthus to that. And on top of that, he added the idea that the, that the environment, because the environment is now shaping organisms, 
that the environment can act like an all-powerful agent. An all-powerful agent. Is this making sense? So he adds this whole idea that nature can act like an agent. The most famous of these statements, Lewontin says, is where Darwin said this, that natural selection, tell me if this doesn't sound like a godlike force. Natural selection is daily and hourly scrutinizing throughout the world every variation, even the slightest, rejecting that which is bad, preserving and adding up all that is good. Hmm. Why is this pardon? This gentleman here, he's not an evolutionist. He's an intelligent design theorist, but he really sums up what Darwin did. When you have all of these random changes, he says that in short, evolutionary biology needs a designer substitute to coordinate the incidental changes that hereditary transmission passes on from one generation to the next. And there's only one naturalistic candidate on the table to wit natural selection. Indeed, it is no accident that the word selection and the word intelligence are etymologically related. The lek in selection has the same root as lig in intelligence, both derived from the same Indo-European root meaning to gather and therefore to choose. So what he's saying is this, you have all these random things and you need something to coordinate them. You need something to what? Sort them out. And this force which Darwin gave it has the ability to think. It's intelligent. And the root words even mean the same. He goes on to point out that before Darwin, the ability to choose was largely confined to designing intelligence like we have. That is to conscious agents that could reflect deliberately on the possible consequences of their choices. Choices like that. Darwin's claim to fame was to argue that natural forces lacking, lacking any purposefulness or provision of future possibilities likewise have the power to choose via natural selection. This is the punchline. In ascribing the power to choose to unintelligent natural forces, Darwin perpetuated the greatest intellectual swindle in the history of ideas. Nature has no power to choose. Do you know why? Because nature is not alive. It's not alive. You know who has been swindled by this idea of natural selection? You have, and I have. We've all been swindled. Nature has no power to choose, but we treat it like it does. And therefore, thoughtful atheists pushed back against Darwin because they said all you did was get God's agency out and you put mother nature in, i.e. the environment, as an active agent. And, this, and Darwin was defensive about this. In 1868, nine years after he published his book, he said, the term natural selection is in some respects a bad one, as it seems to imply conscious choice. Huh, but this will be disregarded after a little familiarity. You better believe it did. You disregarded it. I disregarded it. Creationists, intelligent design people have disregarded it. I have also often personified the word nature, for I have found it difficult to avoid this ambiguity. Do you, know, you want to know why he personifies the word nature? Because when you look at me and you look at any creature, you're looking at something that looks like it was put together by a thinking brain. And you have to explain that. That's why you personify nature, as if it was a thinking brain. Greg Graffin, evolutionary biologist at UCLA says, the trick is, how do you talk about natural selection without implying the rigidity of law? We use it almost as an active participant, almost like a god. In fact, you could substitute the word god for natural selection in a lot of evolutionary writings and you think you're listening to a theologian. It's a routine we know doesn't exist, we teach it anyway. Genetic mutations and some active force to choose the most favorable one. Can you see the mysticism in all of this? Can you see the magic which is pervading their thinking? This is very seductive. Robert Reed, he's also passed away, he says, indeed, the language of neo-Darwinism is so careless that the words divine plan could be substituted for selection pressure 
in any popular work in the biological literature without the slightest disruption in the logical flow of the argument. These guys are atheists. They don't like their atheism being tainted by Darwin's magical selector. He goes on to say, selection pressure is now given a metaphorically creative sense by modern biologists who ought to be flagellating themselves for selection pressure. Hmm. Lynn Margulis, she's also passed away, but she was quoted in this book, The Exposé of Evolution Industry. Darwin was brilliant to make natural selection a sort of godlike term, an expression that could replace God. Who did it? created life forms. It made it easy for his contemporaries to think and verbalize Mr. Big Omnipotent God in the sky, picking out those he wants to keep. He has been conceived of as the natural selector. He throws the others away. This gentleman says natural selection is, is always doing things. And so we hear about the mechanism of selection as well as the forces or pressures that operate in it. We learn that natural selection shapes the bodies and behaviors of organisms, builds specific features, targets or acts on particular genomic regions, favors or disfavors, or even punishes various traits. Evolutionary biologists routinely, routinely speak of natural selection as if it were an, act, an agent. Natural selection becomes rather like an occult power of the pre-scientific age. Are you getting the point? Atheists are sick of this whole idea. And this gentleman here in his essay about natural selection said one source of the trouble is that Darwin liked the term natural selection because it could be used as a substantive governing a verb. Now what does that mean? He treats a concept, natural selection, as if it's a real thing like me that can govern verbs. Can I govern verbs? Can I act? Can I work? Can I choose? Can I call? Can I weed? Of course, I can do all those things because I have a brain. But he treats a concept as if it were a real thing that could do that stuff. And that's why he says, but such use has appeared to reify, even to deify natural selection as an agent. You know what this is? You know what this is by any other term? If I held up a statue and I told you it could act, work, favor, blah, 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 you would immediately see it as idolatry. He's holding up nature and saying it can do the same thing. And that's why Bertrand Russell said, we now can contemplate what Mother Nature did for us. And so this gentleman here pushing back says, what breeds the ghost in Darwinism is its covert appeal to intentional biological explanations. Darwin pointed the direction to a thoroughly naturalistic, indeed a thoroughly atheistic theory of phenotype formation, but he didn't see how to get the whole way there. He killed off God, if you like, but Mother Nature and other pseudo-agents, and he's talking about selection, got away scot-free. We think it's now time to get rid of them too. You know what? It is. And this is how you see it in evolutionary literature. Here's one new scientist, intelligent evolution, how life's processes act like an all-knowing brain. Here's another one, nature's brain, a radical new view of evolution. How does natural selection create so much complexity so fast? A bold new theory says it learns and remembers past solutions just as our brains do. Hmm. Here's a paper from the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, gene co-option. It's explaining how you got oxygen carrying capacity in jawed and jawless fishes, but this is how they end their scientific paper. This example of convergent evolution of protein function provides an impressive demonstration of the ability of natural selection to cobble together complex design solutions by tinkering with different variations of the same basic protein scaffold. This is how they get people thinking that we're the product of these blind forces. Well, then someone will come up and say, well, you know, yeah, I agree that this is abuse, but if you just use the correct definition of natural selection, if you just turn to Webster's, you can get it. But Michael Hodge says a quite general rule issue has still received no canonical treatment. What kind of thing is natural selection anyway? A law, a principle, a force, a cause, an agent, 
all or some of these things. You know why nobody can define what it is? Because it's a concept. It's a concept that's given human-like powers. It's a concept that's given God-like powers. That's why they can't define it. This gentleman, Jerry Fulder, he's also dead. He says, the present worry is that the explication of natural selection by appeal to selective breeding is seriously misleading. In other words, when Darwin said, nature can act like a human breeder, he's misleading you because human breeders have a brain, but nature doesn't. And that it thoroughly misled Darwin. What then is the intended interpretation when one speaks of natural selection? The question is wide open as of this writing. So what did Darwin do? Well, Darwin, he made the analogy that nature could act on creatures like a human breeder, but it can't, because humans have a brain, but nature doesn't. He projects real selective capability onto nature, which means he's projecting onto it intelligence, which it doesn't. And Darwin was the one, nobody else, who coined the term natural selection. So let's close the map here on how this works. We already saw how this mutation summarizes all of this chaotic thinking, which is the anti-design. Well, in selection, you begin with the same materialistic worldview, and you have the assumption that nature can act like a human breeder, that nature has all of those abilities as a breeder. And because they believe that nature can act like a human breeder, they ascribe to nature all of these abilities to favor, work on, act on. Another man says natural selection can see, select, save, and build. And because of all of that, you now have a mystical substitute agent. This is how you get people believing in this counterintuitive view, where you have an anti-design setup over here, and you have a mystical substitute agent there, that you get people from believing when they see creatures that they were created, to believing that they are the product of a chaotic, mindless force of nature. And that's how you take them towards atheistic thinking. This is how it works on all of that. So what would happen to this whole concept of mutation selection if we dumped the word mutation and we replaced it with this, a direct, directed genetic change? Hmm. And what happens if we dropped the word selection and replaced it with successful solutions? In other words, creatures have directed genetic change which successfully solve problems. The entire power the anti-design power completely disappears. So what I'm saying to you is everything in evolutionary thinking is boiling down to this whole idea of mutation and selection, which takes me to the last point, which very short, fortunately, we'll be able to wrap up here in just a couple minutes. Mutation selection style explanations really harm both science and theology. Let's consider a non-illustration. Ooh, I hate to read this. This was ICR's explanation for cave fish, which we had in our original museum. Read what we said. As genetic information is copied and passed on generation after generation, occasionally there are copying mistakes known as mutations. Mutations have been observed to destroy, damage, and corrupt genetic information or to be neutral, but have never been observed to add new information. This is true even of so-called beneficial mutations that may be advantageous to the surviving organism in some creatures. When a mutation occurs in a light environment that animals, causes animals' offspring not to have eyes, it's an enormous disadvantage. So natural selection eliminates this flaw. When the eyeless defect occurs here, that is in a cave, it does not give any disadvantage, so it is not eliminated. In fact, it gives advantages. Those eyes can crash into things, injuring the eyes and get diseases of the eyes, possibly leading to death. Eventually, selective pressures ensure that all are eyeless. These ghostly fish are prime examples of how mutation and natural selection lead to a reduction of functioning systems. These adaptations are no evidence for the, at all for the belief that complexity has arisen by such processes. They only show how information can be lost 
in a fallen world. How many of you have ever repeated that? How many of you have been saying that? Why not? We taught it. So let's go over and sum up what we just said. We just said that surface dwelling features gradually morphed into cave dwelling forms due to random genetic mutations, which led to broken systems, through a purposeless trial and error process of death and survival that resulted in a loss of information that produced deep pigmentation and blindness and selection pressure ensured that all are blind. Why are you laughing? Because we just basically repeated what? Darwin's mechanism. All we did was repeat it. We just repeated it. But then we put the caveat, but this shows how you can break something but not make something. Do you see what we did? We jumped in and we played Darwin's game on Darwin's field by Darwin's rules. And that's why we haven't killed this after 50 years of teaching against it, because we basically said everything he said was true. And once you get into that, you can't win. You can't win. And so for years, we've basically been saying, well, Darwin's mechanism is true, but it's inconsistent, or it's insufficient, or it's incomplete, or it's inaccurate. But the moment we say his mutation selection mechanism is true, we've lost for all the reasons I just gave you up to this point. And that's why, by jumping into that, the details, it derails scientific research by not looking for non-random changes. And only once we broke away from it did we start to develop a continuous environmental tracking model which assumes that organisms are as engineered and much, much, much more than this car and we're looking for corresponding system elements believing that they can be explained by engineering principles. We start looking for non-random changes and we start to find them. We had to break away because it was derailing us. Second, it derails scientific search by not looking for the not broken. So when it came to cave fish, the question is, does a broken system cause cave fish depigmentation? Is the fact that they are now these hypopigmented things because the systems which lead to pigmentation, are they all broken in this fish? So we started to look. And we took this blind cave fish and we put it back in river conditions under real sunlight. And in 32 days, it looked like this. Same fish in both pictures. <sighs> Was the pigmentation system broken? Obviously, it wasn't. It derailed us. Completely derailed us. Mutations for adaptation, no rational engineer would use it. So no wonder people start to question whether God really created us. Theistic selectionism, it's just the creationist's light version of real evolution. That's why it's bad. It personifies nature as if it's causal, which means that we jump into the same realm as the idolatrous pseudo-creator, the great selector. That's bad for theology. Six, natural selection, we always said it's not a creative process, it's a conservative process. Do you know what that meant when we were saying that? It meant this, God created this to operate after the fall so that some of you, when your children have genetic mutations, they will die before they reach reproductive age and that saves the rest of this population from getting their genetic mutations. That's what we're saying. That's pretty gross. But that's what we were saying. And number seven, we said that <laughs> we, we agreed with Gould's perverse indeed idea. In other words, this, Gould was smart enough to realize that Darwin was after something more than just the diversity of life. He wanted to mock God. And people, when they look at creatures, they see evidences of his goodness, his love, his wisdom, and his power. But what Darwinian thinking says is that everything that you thought was good and that demonstrated the goodness of God really came about through a blind struggle for life and death 
where one creature destroys and leads to the extinction of another creature, all for its own selfish advancement. And he says this mocks the Creator God, and he's right. In addition, he has the substitute idolater. So this is why this whole thinking harms. It harms us in many ways. Well, thank you for bearing with me through this process to take you through this whole system. If you want to learn more, and I know most of you probably already do this, sign up for our Acts and Facts, subscribe to our YouTube channel, and hang out here for just a few more minutes. We'll set up and we'll do question and answer. Thank you very much. All right, we're just going to get set up really quick for the Q&A. Am I on, Dave? There we go. We're just going to get set up really quick for the Q&A. And so feel free to either hang here or use the restroom really yeah. quick. Wow, that's but in the meantime, I'm just going to tell you all a few important announcements. If you enjoyed today's sense? event, we do have other events here at the Discovery Center. So that's just a few coming up. Homeschool days are coming up February 21st about through 23rd. The, um, those are just days where homeschoolers yeah. can come and get discounted tickets and experience some live presentations and other exciting here. things. So um, be sure to check that out on Go our ahead. website and plan to attend or Did tell you your homeschooled friends about that. Dinosaur Week at the Discovery Center is coming up March 14th through 18th. That's a Good really fun is, week. You've probably seen the video on the rotating the slides Q&A. between the sessions. It's an exciting week where you can come and experience um, fossil petting Who zoos and more live presentations Good. and getting to see Good. real life casting demonstrations for fossils. Well, so we frankly, really encourage you to take part in that as well. Creation is Day is also them, coming up a little bit questions. later. It's on April 22nd, oh, which is actually on Earth Day, but we okay. celebrate Creation Day because we, we serve and glorify the one who made the Earth. So you can feel free to join us for that. And just as a couple reminders, Dr. Galuza reminded you a minute ago, but be sure to sign up for Acts and Facts. It's completely free, just a really good way to keep up with um, the research yeah. that we're doing here as well as do? different things going on at ICR. Uh, be sure to subscribe on YouTube um, to take part in that content on there. We would love to have you there. And we read all of the comments we, we get, get on that. YouTube. So feel free to, um, for our YouTube audience today, feel free to comment the things. And just as a reminder for those here and online, this is ICR President Dr. Randy Galuza, Research Scientist Dr. Brian Thomas, and um, Director of Research Dr. Tim Clary. So we're just going to get set up here in a minute, and then we have some good questions for y'all. Thank y'all for participating, by the way. We got some great questions in. We got so many that we will not be able to hit all of them today, um, but hopefully we'll be able to hit some that really encourage y'all. Okay. The first question we're going to go into is somebody says, when I share with people that I believe in the creation account from the Bible, those in the medical and scientific community always cite the Neanderthal fossils as their basis for their belief and trust in Darwinism. How do we reconcile this? Is the Neanderthal linked to Adam? And is our human form today a result of natural selection? I guess I have to answer. <laughs> Right. Um, so I think the, the broader understanding, uh, you know, amongst our uh, mainstream friends, 
I believe in evolution, they would say, because of human evolution, because we know that we have apes in our ancestry. That's kind of the gist. And whether they say Neanderthal specifically, or they say Lucy, or whichever you know, species name gets thrown out, it's part of, in their mind, it's part of the fake parade that goes from ape up to man. Uh, and so um, I would say that, uh, that, the, that the reason that, I, of course, I used to believe that because it's all I had ever heard. But so what, what is it that made me change my mind to where now I believe in Adam and not apes? Well, it's because someone challenged me by asking me why I believed what I believed. You know, and they said, well, what is it about fill in the blank? And in your case, it would be Neanderthal. What is it about Neanderthal that has convinced you that it's some sort of a non-human or pre-human? And that's the key question. The reality is that Neanderthals were fully human, descendants of Noah, alive after the flood, who lived in caves that formed in rock layers. The rock layers formed in the flood because of the flood. And then they, so they had to live in these, after the flood, after the caves formed post-flood. So... Uh, so that's, and they were some of Europe's earliest inhabitants right during the Ice Age there. And so that's how it fits in the biblical worldview. But, but in order to get someone around to where they're curious about what your worldview is, we have to first ask them questions about what they believe so that they, uh, until, we just ask them and ask them and ask them until they come up with, you know, they finally will admit at some point, I'm not sure. And, uh, and then when, it, when, when they reach that point, then it's, that's, that's when we come in with, with some answers, when they're actually curious about that. So meanwhile, mega resources on this. We have a new book, Human Origins. We've got a DVD, um, Adam or Apes. It's all right here um, in our bookstore. And free web articles. I mean, you can just type in Neanderthal at icr.org and you'll get you know, 20, 50 articles and you can learn all about it there for free also. Did any of the rest of you have anything to say on that? Or? Okay. So our next question, we actually received several questions with a similar theme. So I'm just going to summarize that theme. Um, we received several questions basically asking, and I know, Dr. Galuza, you hit this pretty hard with your theistic selectionism in your most recent talk, but we're still receiving questions. Could God have used evolution to create? No. Uh, the, the answer is, and, and it's pretty, and you know who else says that? Almost all evolutionists who are thoughtful evolutionists and atheistic evolutionists would say that he doesn't do it. I just went through a whole talk explaining what the core tenets of evolutionary theory were. They weren't make-believe. I drug you through reading four of these complicated things, and the complicated key factors is that evolution occurs through the accumulation of adaptations which are brought about through massive random genetic mistakes leading to accidental things that are broken that are sorted out by a mystical substitute agent, natural selection. The whole intent of all of that was to be anti-design and therefore anti-theistic by nature. And there was an online debate between Francis Collins, the former director of the CDC, and, and Richard Dawkins. And that was the question, exactly what Lauren just read. read. Couldn't God have used the evolutionary process? And of course, Francis Collins, as a theistic evolutionist, says, well, yes, he could have. But Richard Dawkins, as a thoughtful atheist, said, why would God use the very mechanism which says God does not exist to bring about the process that says that he does exist? You know, he knows exactly what evolutionary theory means, even though Francis Collins doesn't. So if you're going to stay true to the intent of evolutionary theory and treat it respectfully, it is an anti-design mechanism. Therefore, it is fundamentally anti-theistic. Therefore, you're not going to use that mechanism. And the reality is, biblically, God used the direct creation where he built creatures with corresponding systems so that when people see it, they will conclude, oh, this microphone looks like it was put together by an agent. I have similar things in my voice box or my ear or whatever. It probably was put together as well so that people could come to that logical conclusion. Thank you. This one might be one that Dr. Clary might want to speak on. 
Does the fossil record also include fossils of humans along with animal fossils from the flood? Well, that's, that's, there's not very many. There's not very many human fossils in the flood rocks. That, that there may be a few. Some of them have been discounted by a lot of the evolutionists uh, in more recent times. But 100 years ago and things, there were some fossils that might have you know, really shown human fossils buried in the flood. Uh, but they've been kind of discounted. But there aren't very many, and I think part of that's because the humans were probably buried last if they're buried at all. And a lot of them, I think, washed off into the oceans, like a lot of the animals, uh, as the water went over the top, these waves just kept going right across. And so a lot of things were spread all over the world. And if you weren't buried deep, you weren't gonna become a fossil. And so if you weren't really buried deep enough, even if you're buried a little bit, but if you're not buried deep enough, there's a, you kind of have to cut off the oxygen or else things will decay away very quickly. And so if you aren't buried fast and deep, you're not gonna become a fossil. I'm not sure if all the humans uh, were buried deep enough, and so you didn't really see many human fossils that are preserved. And then there's been 4,500 years or so of erosion since the time of the flood as well. So it's, but I think a lot of them might have just got washed off. Now, Dr. Bryan thinks that you know humans were so violent in the pre-flood world there might not have been that many humans, uh, but even if there were maybe a billion, they many of them probably got washed off. And you're looking at rocks preserving things. You know, you have to be buried fast and deep. Do either of you two have anything to say on that as well? Okay. Next question, somebody asks, critics of intelligent design theory frequently complain that the concept cannot be falsified or tested. Can you comment on how to respond to such criticism? Thank you. Oh. Sorry, Dr. Thomas. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, clearly it can be, it can be tested. I, I, I'm putting out a a model of adaptation where it says organisms continuously track environmental changes. And therefore, there are several assumptions and presuppositions in that, in that model, just like evolutionary theory has some models. One, which can be tested, is I assert that not 99%, but 100% of adaptive capacity will be found within the organisms. In other words, organisms were created to um, sense what's happening in their environment, they're pre-programmed with information that enables them to adapt and to adjust themselves appropriately. There, there's a testable thing. 100% of adaptive capacity will be within the organism. All you have to do is just find something outside the organism which confers it con adaptive capacity. Second, I also said that in terms of adaptation and in terms of many biological functions, that they will operate by engineering principles. They're gonna operate by the same engineering principles that man-made things operate by in terms of the basics. The design of them is far more complicated than man-made things, but in terms of the basic principles by which they operate, they're gonna operate by engineering principles. There's a testable thing as well. Just find something on an organism or living creatures that can't be explained by engineering principles. That has to be explained by some kind of magical force or something like that. There's something that's testable. So these are testable, um, these are testable assertions. I also would assert that in terms of their adaptive ability, the solutions precede the challenges. The exact opposite of what evolutionary theory says. They say the challenges precede the solutions. But I'm saying, no, organisms were built with their solutions up front. We can look for those and find them and see if they end up with some cumulative ability or whether their solutions really do precede them. So people make the assertion that it's not testable, don't really read the literature, because this is all in the literature uh, in advance. And um, I think these are pretty good testable things, and we could go on and on. Dr. Thomas, did you have something you wanted to add to that while you were watching the mic pass over you? Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, somebody else has a question that's related to Dr. Cleary's talk on deep time. Where do present day mountain ranges fit into the flood sequence presented by Dr. Cleary? You guys are getting your exercise today. <laughs> well, I, I did mention in my talk, but it was, it was going kind of quick, but the, most of the mountain ranges, most, not all of them, a few of them formed during the flood, like the Appalachians and probably the Urals, but most of them occurred as the waters began to recede you have this sort of equilibration, or you have this isostasy, they call it, where the over-thickening of 
these subduction zones where you have subducted crust underneath, regular crust, those areas came very thick, and the thicker areas are going to rise upward and, and sink downward. And so most of the mountain ranges did happen as the waters were starting to recede at the very onset of the receding phase, I call it. So early in what's called the Cenozoic or the, the Tejas mega sequence, the last sequence, or it used to be called the tertiary, those sorts of terms you might have heard, things after the dinosaurs were wiped out, uh, that's when the land started to recede and the mountains started to kind of grow. So most of the mountains weren't there that we see today uh, it, during the pre-flood world and also even during the flood until the, the receding phase when they started to really rise. And that was the source of a lot of those sediments on the tops of those mountains. They were ripped off as the water was going down and transported across to the Great Plains here in the United States or off into the Gulf of Mexico and those different offshore areas on, on every coast. So that's kind of how the mountains fit into the whole situation. But it's a mystery as to how come 80% or so of the world's mountains all form at once. You know, if you go back in geologic time, if you believe in deep time, well, why do so many mountains all form at the same time? And the flood is the best answer for that as well, because that's the that receding phase when things are equilibrating. That's fantastic. Thank you, Dr. Clary. <laughs> yes, Dr. Thomas. This one actually relates to... Um, I was going to be mean and say someone other than Dr. Thomas, but no, I'm not going to do that. So this one relates to topics addressed by all three of you. Can we say with confidence that the earth and all that was in it was formed approximately 6,000 years ago? I can say that with confidence because I'm basing my answer to that question on the Bible. And the Bible is an eyewitness, uh, an account, and it's, um, and it's, and it's, uh, it's as God's word. Uh, he, he divinely inspired it, and so whatever information we can get from the Bible is actually uh, is pertaining to the past is, um, is of a much higher quality and trustworthy level than what we can guess about the past from looking at uh, features of the, of the natural world, so to speak. So yeah, it's about 6,000 years. So we think about um, a couple thousand years ago, um, the Lord Jesus was on earth. Um, and uh, 2166 BC, Abraham, Abe was born, and, a couple, and he was he lived uh, uh, three or four hundred years after the flood. And then you add up the the chronogenealogical data from Genesis chapter five, and you get 1656 years from creation to the flood. So it's about 2,000 years from creation to Abe, another few thousand from Abe to Christ and another, a third 2,000 from Christ to us. And that's all um, from, from the first Adam to the last Adam, th that information is all in the Bible. Okay, what are some specific um, research, let's see, yes. What are some specific research findings that ICR is discovering that prove that um, continuous environmental tracking is still happening and disprove natural selectionism? Good, great question. Well, if you're here for the last part of my talk, you saw that we're doing research on these blind cave fish. There's a lot of things we can learn from them and creatures like them that have migrated into different environments and expressed traits which are highly suitable to those environments. Now, we, we're working on blind cave fish, but here's an, here's an explanation for continuous environmental tracking. When creatures find them, themselves in a cave, um, they generally express a whole suite of similar types of traits. Obviously, many of them go blind. They lose their pigmentation. They change their feeding behaviors. And for ter terms of fish, they change their schooling behaviors. Their circadian rhythms are changed. The metabolic processes change so they can handle decreased food supplies. Their sleep cycles change. And a whole bunch of other things. And they all seem to change together. And it's not just fish. It's, there's insects that do it. There's other um, uh, invertebrates that do it. There's crustaceans that do it. There's worms that do it. There's crickets that do it. There are all of these creatures, when they find themselves in a cave, express these very similar types of traits. Why are they doing that? And why are they doing it consistently? And why are they doing it repeatedly? When I mean consistently, I mean across different kinds of creatures. And why are they doing it repeatedly? You have to believe in a lot of fortuitous stacking of good luck 
from the from the selectionist viewpoint to believe that all these different creatures are going to express all these different traits that are so highly suitable and they all seem to do it relatively quickly on that or maybe there's a design mechanism that enables them to detect when they're in a cave and and change and it's not just cave features or other features as well um, and we'll be we, we actually have posted a lot of articles as dr. Thomas said you just have to uh, do a search on our webpage on continuous environmental tracking, and you'll get literally dozens of articles written by myself, Dr. Thomas, Dr. Tompkins, have all written about this, how these organisms track these environmental changes. In addition, when it talks about natural selection, I don't treat natural selection as if it's a real thing. It's a concept. It's a mystical mental construct that when people see something, they see an environment, and they see a changed creature, in their brain, they believe it was favored. In their brain, they believe it was selected for or selected against. They believe that nature acted on it. That's all happening in their brain. It's not happening out in nature. You can't, you can't point to the selection event. You can't identify something in nature that's equivalent to a human brain that you would apply selection to it. So it's a concept. And I would encourage us not to treat it as if it's a real thing. Treat it as what it is. It's a mental construct. In fact, it's a mystical mental construct. So that in and of itself isn't really active. And better yet, let's not look to the environment. Let's look to, to the creature and specifically inside the creature for how these changes are happening. Thank you, Dr. Galuza. Dr. Thomas, Dr. Clary, anything to add on that? Okay, yeah, you, you about covered it all. That's fantastic. Well, the long and short of this whole day is that we are not being shaped by random processes. The things around us are not being shaped by random processes. We were designed in eternity past by a creator who loves us and sent his son to save our sins, to save us from our sins. And we can glorify him as our creator and sustainer. We can put him on the throne that he rightfully deserves, that Darwin does not. So hopefully this event has been an encouragement to you. Um, we hope and pray that you will consider these, whether you're already convinced of these things or whether they're really on your heart and mind and you're struggling with them, we encourage you to think it through. And as you have other questions, please turn to ICR's um, free resources and also feel free to look through our books um, and DVDs if there's anything there that could encourage you. Thank you so much for coming to the Darwin Dethrone Seminar at the ICR Discovery Center. We will see you next time.
When did dinosaurs live? Where do they fit in the Bible? And how did they go extinct? If you have questions about dinosaurs, join us March 14th through 18th at the ICR Discovery Center for Dinosaur Week. Learn about these remarkable reptiles and the fascinating fossils they left behind from ICR's experts and special guest, David Mickelson of Everything Fossil. Experience interactive, hands-on fossil preparation and casting workshops. Unearth dinosaur bones at our fossil dig tables, enjoy our fossil petting zoo, and marvel at our full-size dinosaur fossil exhibit. Visit icr.org events to plan your visit.